On March 15, 2011, Martin Sims was wandering down the streets of Carson, California. His clothes were ragged, he was filthy, and gibbering like a madman with a full beard and long, unkempt hair. His body was covered in scars, but he showed no signs of malnutrition. What made Martin's sudden appearance so remarkable? He'd been missing for three years. When he was interviewed by police, they asked him where he'd been all this time. They couldn't believe his answer. He'd been trapped in an IKEA since 2008, but this was no ordinary IKEA. This was a dangerous anomaly that would come to be known as SCP-3008. Martin's strange answers in his interview were laughed off by his interviewing officers, who assumed he was either crazy or under the influence of something, but they caught the attention of an SCP Foundation field agent embedded in the precinct. The report was passed up the chain to a local site director who approved a detachment of Foundation field operatives to look into Martin's case. While he was reluctant to lead the Foundation agents back to the offending IKEA, the Foundation can be extremely persuasive. His screams of, please, I'm begging you, don't take me back, don't make me go back, were noted but ultimately disregarded. When the SCP Foundation had triangulated the position of SCP-3008, which was indeed an active IKEA, the entire retail zone was closed and barricaded under the pretense of a severe black mold infestation. Armed Foundation personnel also arrived on the site shortly after, based on Martin's vague statements that there were creatures of some kind inside. Due to his deteriorating mental health, Martin was unable to provide a great deal of lucid information on the specific traits of SCP-3008, but one phrase he kept repeating was, bigger on the inside. Once researchers were satisfied that Martin had delivered all the pertinent information he was able to, he was administered Foundation amnestics to erase his memory of the last three years and return to his family. A cover story was formulated. Martin had been kidnapped and abused for three years by a mentally unbalanced stalker in downtown Carson. He'd been able to escape as said stalker took his own life out of guilt, a suicide that the Foundation expertly fabricated to make their cover story airtight. With the loose end of Martin Sims taking care of, the true observation of SCP-3008 could begin. A base set around the perimeter of the mysterious IKEA kept a 24-hour watch on the building, covering all potential entrances and exits. No exploratory missions had yet been approved by the Foundation Ethics Committee, so they first wanted to perform a week of external observation to see if any of the store's anomalous properties extended beyond the confines of the building. After a week of nothing, it appeared they did not. A local site director approved of the use of 20 disposable Class D personnel to explore the interior of SCP-3008. The D-Class operatives would be split into four squads of five men, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta Squad. Each would be assigned a different quadrant of the store and would deliver information back to the control team on site via a live audio and video link. Three of the four teams upon entering the store reported nothing out of the ordinary. Neither the audio or video they were sending back indicated anything different from a standard IKEA store, from the flat pack wardrobes to the Swedish meatballs. Team Delta, however, suddenly began experiencing a scrambled audio and video connection. Shortly after, communication with Team Delta dropped off entirely. They disappeared somewhere inside the store and haven't been seen since, with one notable exception. After the disappearance and the extraction of teams, Foundation researchers classified SCP-3008 as Euclid because its anomalous properties were at least confined to the interior of the store, and even then seemingly not the entire interior. The anomalous area within SCP-3008 became known as SCP-3008-1, and containment appeared to be 100% secure. There was no telling how many people had already gone missing in the store over the years, but the disappearances must be stopped. The Foundation maintained constant surveillance around the perimeter of SCP-3008, but it appeared they could prevent any further incidents by simply preventing other civilians from accessing the IKEA store. Martin's ravings about monsters were assumed to just be the product of delirium, until a surviving member of Delta Team suddenly reappeared. The date was November 3, 2011. It was a cold night, a few hours after what would have been closing time if the store were still active and seven months after the extraction teams had disappeared somewhere in the confines of SCP-3008. There had been no anomalous activity outside the store since the perimeter was first secured, and the Foundation researchers hadn't expected that to change, until the last surviving member of Delta Team came barging out of the store's entrance. Startled field operatives were amazed to see him again, but they were even more amazed to see what was following him out of the store, repeating the same phrase, the store is now closed, please exit the building. Despite the fact that the entity chasing the Delta Team survivor was wearing the yellow shirt and blue pants of an IKEA store employee, the being definitely was not human. 
It was around 7 feet tall with no visible face. The entity had grossly extended limbs, with each arm being around 5 or 6 feet long and ending in a huge oversized hand. The whole process was so sudden that the field agents present at the perimeter weren't able to save the Delta Team survivor as the entity reached forward with his freakishly long arms, grabbed him and twisted his head off like a child with a doll. The field operatives present drew their weapons and peppered the entity with bullets. It would later be classified as SCP-3008-2. The being appeared to collapse and die from the physical trauma, at which point it and the body of the former Delta Team survivor were taken for an autopsy by Foundation researchers. There were no biological abnormalities of the body of the Delta the team survivor, so it did not appear that the anomalous properties of SCP-3008-1 had any effect on the physiology of its occupants. He was not malnourished despite being missing for months, and the contents of his stomach looked to be half-digested food consistent with the menu of a typical IKEA store restaurant. SCP-3008-2, on the other hand, raised a number of perplexing biological questions. The autopsy revealed that the creature's clothes were actually part of its body, like an additional layer of skin. The creature lacked blood or any kind of vascular system. Even stranger, the entity didn't appear to have bones or internal organs, not even a brain or nervous system. It was a being made entirely of skin all the way to its core. How it was able to move, or even live for that matter, remains a mystery. Though when you work for the SCP Foundation, you learn to accept that some things will always remain unexplained. One thing was certain though, Martin Sims was right about his monsters. After the incident with the Delta Team, the Foundation deemed that sending manned explorations into the heart of SCP-3008 was too much of a liability and planned a series of drone-based reconnaissance missions into the anomaly. The first of these drones experienced connection issues and failed when attempting to venture into the IKEA's anomalous zone. However, However, after a lengthy period of trial and error, the Foundation was able to establish a more secure connection with its drones, even when deep into the SCP-3008-1 anomalous zone. It was only then that some of the most extraordinary discoveries were made. SCP-3008-1 seemed to break the laws of spatial reality, as the area of the IKEA's interior was at least an order of magnitude larger than its exterior. Just as Martin Sims had said, it was bigger on the inside, but just how much bigger? The Foundation has yet to find evidence of any physical term within the store that might indicate SCP-3008-1 has an end point, while an area of at least 10 kilometers squared has been uncovered in SCP-3008-1. It could, in theory, be infinite. Laser rangefinder tests, which are normally very reliable, have only given inconclusive results. Interestingly, the anomalous area doesn't have any clear visual differences from the rest of the IKEA store, except that it extends forever. An individual trapped within the confines of SCP-3008-1 wouldn't even realize they've entered an anomalous zone until they tried to locate an exit and leave, at which point they'd find they were already hopelessly lost. The geography of SCP-3008-1 does at least appear to be consistent, so people trapped within are theoretically able to retrace their steps and escape if they haven't already ventured to too deep. According to data collected during the drone reconnaissance missions, SCP-3008-2, of which there appear to be a vast population, would wander the stores aimlessly during the day. They are unresponsive to the drone's presence and did not appear to be aggressive. While the physical descriptions of these creatures could vary slightly, they all follow the same overall trend. Clothes, consistent with an IKEA uniform, no face, either seemingly too tall or too short, and limbs that are grossly out of proportion with their bodies. As the Foundation began sending drones deeper and SCP-3008-1, they found another incredible discovery. There was an unknown population of humans trapped inside IKEA's anomalous zone, and these people had used the IKEA furniture around them to create entire settlements and towns within the store. There were several of these towns, all of which seemed to cohabitate peacefully. Even Foundation personnel found this development in their research to be truly extraordinary. Since SCP-3008 was first identified, there have been only 14 civilian escapes. Some had been trapped inside for months, others had been in there for years, some far longer than Martin's three-year stint. While every one of these escapees has eventually been released back to their home, after a liberal application of amnestics and a proper cover story has been devised, the Foundation interviewed each of them extensively first. According to each of these escapees, the people trapped inside the IKEA have built an entirely new society across the various settlements. Contrary to the Lord of the Flies' expectations of a group of people isolated and afraid, there is immense cooperation between the trapped civilians. The food in the several IKEA restaurants in SCP-3008-1 
mysteriously replenishes while nobody's there, so there's no threat of starving, and the automatic turning on and off of the lights forms as a rudimentary kind of day and night cycle. Nighttime, however, is when things get dangerous, as the SCP-3008-2 entities, which are known to the people inside as the staff, become extremely hostile after dark. Aggressive hordes of the staff swarm the settlements at night, repeating, this door is now closed, please exit the building. The civilians inside are usually able to repel these attacks with minimal casualties, but the constant war of attrition slowly wears down those inside. The bodies of the creatures also need to be removed from the area after each attack, as the presence of corpses or even parts of corpses has been known to heighten the ferocity of the next night's attack. During the day, the staff return to a docile and unresponsive state, though they'll still defend themselves violently if anyone dares to attack. Over the course of the interviews with the 14 escapees, Foundation researchers were able to answer another of their key questions. How had so many people gone missing in the store for so long without being noticed? But the answer they received only raised many more unsettling queries. According to the escapees, there were people inside the settlements that, despite being otherwise of entirely sound mind and standard intelligence, seemed to lack very common knowledge that even a child should know. For example, some of them weren't aware of the International Space Station orbiting the Earth, or stranger still, the existence of the Statue of Liberty. This led the researchers to a frightening conclusion. SCP-3008-1 may not only be a nexus point of multiple IKEA stores in our dimension, it could be connected to IKEAs in every dimension where IKEAs exist. While it only abducts a handful of people from each store over an extended period of time, it suddenly becomes clear how this SCP was able to trap so many people without detection over such a long period of time, which in turn led to an even more terrifying revelation. The SCP Foundation may not have SCP-3008-1 as contained as they thought. It might even be tucked away in an IKEA store somewhere near you, just waiting for you to visit. After all, there's always room for one more. An SCP Foundation researcher sits at a table inside of a standard containment cell. These are often dangerous places to be, especially when the SCP you're supposed to be studying is one that you can't see. The researcher is taking notes, unsure of exactly what is going to happen next. He can hear the sounds of knives scraping behind, of flesh sizzling and searing from high heat. He braces himself as a burst of heat hits the back of his head, as if a fireball has erupted. An object floats through the air and settles in front of him on the table. It's a plate of food, and it looks delicious. It may surprise you to learn that there is no rule that the SCP Foundation must deal exclusively with violent and vicious creatures. Not every SCP held in containment shares the same malevolence and contempt for humanity as SCP-682 or the world-ending threat posed by the likes of SCP-2317. Some, perhaps not many, but some, are benign and might even seem outwardly friendly. But you'd still be taking a huge risk to assume that anything contained by the SCP Foundation is completely harmless. Such is the case with SCP-5031. As per the Foundation's containment procedures, this quasi-humanoid, meaning it appears to have some vaguely human features, is held in an airtight cell that is regularly checked by Foundation personnel on a bi-weekly basis. SCP-5031 has no need for regular nutrition or regular interactions from staff. The trick with SCP-5031 is not being eaten by it, since though it doesn't need food, it does still hunt and consume anything it encounters, human or otherwise. Avoiding being eaten is hard enough with creatures that can actually be seen, but like so many other creatures the Foundation keeps contained, SCP-5031 has developed an almost perfect defense mechanism, which is when observed, it will literally cease to exist. Some might choose to refer to this as a quantum lock, however it is worth noting that traces left by SCP-5031 still remain observable when the creature has temporarily disappeared. For example, trails of blood and scratch marks left behind by SCP-5031 still exist when the SCP itself does not. Naturally, this makes both avoiding the creature and capturing it using cameras difficult. However, when SCP-5031's existence ceases, it still casts a shadow. From this, researchers have been able to determine several of the creature's physical traits. Based on its silhouette, it has been deduced that SCP-5031 levitates about half a meter above ground level, sports an abnormally small necklace head atop an elongated torso, approximately 1.9 meters long. 
with three sets of spindly lower arms that branch outwards. Using these arms and its loosely hanging body, SCP-5031 will lower itself to hunt any human or animal that draws near to it, and uses the blade-like tail to cut up food. Perhaps the most interesting facet of SCP-5031 beyond its defensive capabilities and apparent physical attributes are the series of nine tests conducted by senior researcher Stanley Huxtable. Appalled by the conditions that the creature was being kept in, Huxtable took over the role of HCL supervisor for SCP-5031. Having grown increasingly frustrated and empathetic towards the creature, listening to its screams from inside its iron containment unit, Huxtable devised a series of tests to introduce SCP-5031 to various different stimuli as a way to better understand the creature, and hopefully keep it contained in a way that didn't seem to cause so much suffering. It's worth remembering that the SCP Foundation makes its mission to be cold, not cruel, in performing their duties to protect normality and many of the researchers and staff are just as capable of having empathy for creatures as you might for a stray animal at a shelter. The first of Huxtable's tests involved installing speakers in SCP-5031 cell, through which a variety of different ambient and popular pieces of music were played to see if they had any effect on reducing the creature's stress. By judging SCP-5031 stress levels based on how much it screamed when compared to normal, Huxtable was able to determine how to best use music to calm the creature. SCP-5031 seemed to convey higher levels of stress when listening to Morning Forest, Deep Grotto, and Seaside Paradise ambience, as well as the best of late 60s British rock band Jethro Tull. However, the best of Mozart, Enya, Kiss, and Ben Folds produced dramatically different results, decreasing SCP-5031's apparent stress. Following this test, senior researcher Huxtable compiled a playlist featuring SCP-5031's favorite music. Over time, the stress-reducing effects of music on SCP-5031 seemed to decrease, but keeping the playlist on shuffle seemed to keep the creature consistently calmer than it had been previously. The next test involved introducing inanimate objects into SCP-5031's enclosure to monitor its reactions and how its stress levels were affected. When a softball was thrown into the enclosure, SCP-5031 immediately sliced the ball in two with its tail in one swift motion. A similar result occurred when researchers threw the creature a basketball, which was quickly punctured and sliced open by SCP-5031's tail. Its stress levels first seemed to diminish when the creature was offered a bowling ball, which it rolled around the enclosure and then later knocked it against a second bowling ball. However, when one of the balls chipped, rendering it unable to roll properly, SCP-5031 stress increased dramatically until a replacement was offered. Researcher Huxtable noted that SCP-5031 seemed to possess a similar level of motor skills to an average human toddler, with similarly explosive emotional reactions to match. <laughs> Next, when given the choice between two food sources at opposite ends of its enclosure, SCP-5031 seemed to gravitate towards higher quality food, most notably favored cooked rotisserie chickens over animal carcasses. It even chose this option over a live chicken, using its tail to cut its food into more manageable bite-sized portions, rather than ripping its meat with its hands or teeth like many of its fellow SCPs. Researcher Huxtable recorded these findings and highlighted that, even though SCP-5031 didn't need to eat in order to survive, providing the creature with food of a better quality marginally reduced its stress. Senior researcher Huxtable next attempted to test SCP-5031's coexistence with other living subjects, each time making sure that the creature had been adequately fed to avoid any unseemly incidents. First, a live chicken was introduced. SCP-5031 rolled its bowling ball at high speed towards the chicken, increasing both its and the chicken's stress levels and inadvertently killing the chicken in the process. When a second chicken was introduced, SCP-5031 gently rolled a basketball towards it, but ceased any further engagement after the chicken squawked from being hit by the ball. Next to be introduced into the enclosure was a blindfolded D-Class staff member, who was instructed to sit down and roll the basketball towards SCP-5031. After doing so for several minutes, the creature began to approach the D-Class subject, who was instructed to remove their blindfold to cease the creature's existence and prevent any potentially deadly incidents. Finally, researcher Huxtable had another Class D engage in a game of catch with SCP-5031 while facing away from the creature. This test proceeded successfully, 
and senior researcher Huxtable remarked how SCP-5031's motor skills were improving, albeit gradually and with some gentle encouragement. Through Huxtable's tests, the creature was learning. The next test, focused on teaching SCP-5031 linguistic symbols, utilized LCD displays and buttons connected to a food dispenser. One display showed an image of a rock, and the other an image of a rotisserie chicken. After some brief probing, SCP-5031 was quickly able to understand that pressing the button under the correct display would dispense a rotisserie chicken for it to eat. The creature was later able to adapt when, the following day, the screen displays and materials dispensed were swapped, and then later set to swap at random intervals. When additional rock dispensing stations were introduced, this time displaying the word rock as opposed to an image, SCP-5031 was able to determine which station dispensed chicken through a process of elimination. Whenever the functions and displays were swapped, SCP-5031 would find whichever displayed the word chicken to receive its food. The final phase of this test presented SCP-5031 with a single station, displaying the word chicken, but with a button that would remain inactive unless the creature spelled out the same word with a collection of lettered blocks it was provided with. After some initial confusion and frustrations as to why the button would not dispense food when pressed, SCP-5031 was able to assemble the word correctly, not only activating the button and dispensing food, but proving to researcher Huxtable that the creature was capable of learning language. Huxtable continued to test the creature, encouraging it to spell words using lettered blocks as a method of communicating. By increasing SCP-5031's vocabulary and the amount of human interaction it received, senior researcher Huxtable observed that SCP-5031 was gradually learning to sing, albeit non-verbally, as well as to juggle with its six hands and was even communicating its food preferences and dish pairings. Later, another Class D, D-52125, was introduced to SCP-5031's enclosure to aid in further testing. Through D-52125's instructions, the creature quickly learned to draw using crayons and created artworks depicting itself. Its newfound friend D-52125, researcher Huxtable, a cat, and a rotisserie chicken. SCP-5031's new creative side didn't stop there, though as the creature quickly learned to play chopsticks in only two days once a piano was introduced into the enclosure. SCP-5031 even managed to start creating its own original, admittedly crude, compositions. Next, a spice rack was placed inside the creature's cell, and D-52125 demonstrated how to season meat. This proved to be SCP-5031's new favorite hobby, as it spent the next three days experimenting with different combinations of foods and spices using its letter blocks to request more, more, more garlic powder. Interestingly, the creature only created artwork or music when D-52125 was present, but seemed to thoroughly enjoy its experimentation with food when left alone. Following this development, senior researcher Huxtable devised a new test for SCP-5031, providing the creature with cooking utensils and using D-52125 to demonstrate. 5031 was shown how to prepare a variety of different dishes, from hamburgers and tacos to Mongolian beef, steak, clam chowder, and profiteroles. In addition to a small peanut allergy, this eighth test revealed SCP-5031 to be a phenomenal chef, possessing culinary skills far beyond the average person. The creature quickly and enthusiastically embraced its newfound talents, concocting its very own brand new recipes, with D-52125 even volunteering to be the first to taste test 5031's dishes. It was shortly after this test that SCP-5031 spoke its very first word. And it should come as no surprise that the word was salt. Naturally, senior researcher Huxtable was very proud of the progress the creature had made with its development. The final test almost seemed to be what the creature was born for. Over the course of two months, SCP-5031 was tasked with creating a full three-course meal, which would then be served to Foundation staff for Thanksgiving. SCP-5031 not only rose to the task, but exceeded all of researcher Huxtable's expectations, creating a meal that even Gordon Ramsay would be hard-pressed to find fault with. The creature created a first course consisting of sweet potato miso soup seasoned with turmeric, Next came a beautiful duck confit, glazed luxuriously with apple cider, and topped generously with sweet cranberry compote, paired with a side of butternut squash gnocchi and served on a bed of kale seasoned with truffle salt. 
The grand finale of the exquisite meal was a spiced cassava pie for dessert, complemented with the finest French vanilla ice cream and a maple hazelnut syrup. And SCP-5031 didn't stop there. The creature also debuted one of its original musical compositions to complement the decadent meal it had created. As the staff enjoyed the food, SCP-5031 performed live from its enclosure the deeply moving Piano Concerto for Six Hands to an overwhelmingly positive response from not only senior researcher Huxtable, but the entire Foundation staff. As a fitting end to the creature's tale, Huxtable reported that, during the Thanksgiving banquet it had created, SCP-5031's stress levels reduced entirely. New, kinder containment measures that would keep 5031 safer but also far more contented were submitted for approval. Perhaps some of you may find it refreshing to learn that SCP-5031 isn't simply just another malicious, malevolent monster that the Foundation has to keep under lock and key for the safety of the world. Instead, SCP-5031 is a gentle, if a little frightening at first, creature that just requires careful and considered guidance instead of a cold iron cage and around-the-clock armed guards. Through testing, senior researcher Stanley Huxtable and his fellow Foundation staff were not only able to help the creature develop, but also found what makes it tick, and not just for the purposes of containing it. Instead, it is hoped that SCP-5031's creativity and flair for culinary and musical masterpieces can continue to thrive and grow under the proud watch of researcher Huxtable. Over 50 men and women, clad in red robes, kneel before an unholy altar. They chant and mutter indecipherable words, words of cruelty and madness, of obsession and sacrilege. Not long ago, these were regular people, computer technicians, teachers, plumbers, construction workers, accountants. This was before they fell under the ungodly influence of a new ruler. The center of this makeshift place of worship was once a normal school gymnasium, but it's now the home of a huge statue. A humanoid being, wreathed in tentacles, its head is more like a squid or cuttlefish than anything resembling an actual human face. While he's known to the cultists as the Tentacled God, the beast they worship is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-2662, and he sits in the belly of one of their expansive containment facilities, locked away from the world. But not for long, if his devoted followers have anything to say about it. This is their god, all-powerful and unchanging, and when it comes to springing him from containment, no tactic is too vile or underhanded to get the job done. Their mortal leader and high priest, a man in a purple robe calling himself Brother Marsh, walks among their crouched forms. He whispers instructions for the great day of liberation that's soon to come, providing everyone plays their part. It's a plan months in the making, and one that, if it goes off without a hitch, could free their monstrous god into the world. They would strike at the very heart of their enemy, the SCP Foundation, when they least expect it. And nothing shall stand in their way. How could they lose when they have a god on their side? But why did all these normal people become violent zealots for a squid-faced deity? It all began with a dream. To those who experienced these dreams, they felt more like prophecies, premonitions of the glorious horrors to come. A red sky, billions dead, and billions more enslaved, a dark silhouette on the horizon, their tentacled god holding dominion over all. At first, it just seemed like a strange nightmare. The ones who experienced it woke up shaken and afraid, hoping to shake the images from their mind, but they couldn't. Every night, the nightmare would return. They'd see the images, the red sky, the dead and enslaved, the tentacled god. And after a while, it would come to them even when they weren't asleep, eventually happening whenever they closed their eyes. Little by little, this scene stopped looking so hideous and started to look glorious. They felt his presence in their minds slowly pushing them towards their inevitable future. They started to realize that they wanted him to rule over the universe and to experience the honor of serving him. Many of them abandoned their homes and families leaving their friends and loved ones left to worry that they'd gone insane. In their eyes, they were safer than they'd ever been. They finally had purpose. 
They were working in service of something far greater than themselves. The influence of the tentacled god drew them closer to one another. They would meet in secret, exchanging information from the prophecies their ruler sent to them in their dreams. They worshipped together, building altars and idols to congregate around. They performed dark blood rituals involving human and animal sacrifice. It was when Brother Marsh, the Anointed One, arrived to guide them towards their true mission that things kicked into high gear. Just three months prior, Brother Marsh had been an office drone working in data entry for a large insurance company before the tentacled god invaded his thoughts with a simple message. Free me, and the new world I create shall be your playground. Since then, he devoted himself completely to the cause, quitting his job and maxing out his credit cards to help fund his new life's purpose infiltrating the SCP Foundation and releasing his inhuman ruler from its imprisonment. That was the single goal he united the cultists under, freedom for the tentacled god. And at long last, they had all the pieces in place to strike. They'd finally gathered the necessary intel to subvert the will of the most powerful secret organization on Earth. Even the strongest institution is made of people, and people are weak. Unlike the almighty tentacled god, people could be broken. The people in question were Kelly Thompson, Sidney Levitt, Jordan Broche, Dr. Juan Gutierrez, and Jillian Larson. Dr. Juan Gutierrez was a researcher with level 3 clearance on the site where the tentacled god was being contained. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both security officers charged with verifying personnel clearance on site. Kelly Thompson was a member of site administration with research authorization powers and Jillian Larson was a research assistant who often collaborated with Dr. Gutierrez. These five were the key to getting access to SCP-2662 and bringing their plan to fruition. Normally, personnel dossiers on people working for the Foundation were highly confidential, but the devotees of the tentacled god had their ways. They had a number of computer experts in their ranks, more than capable of hacking in and pulling some basic information off of Foundation servers without being detected. For the other information they needed, they turned to some good old-fashioned torture, which is often the most effective method when you need some quick results. Of course, while the cult's grip on sanity may have been a little tenuous, they weren't stupid. While gathering their intel, they also made sure to find out what exactly they were up against. SCP-2662 was being held in a humanoid containment cell and guarded by on-site Task Force Town 9, better known as the Belligerent Bodyguards. These aren't lazy, donut-chomping mall cops. These are a heavily trained, heavily armed fighting force. Though the cultists had one thing that these Foundation soldiers didn't, the element of surprise. For everything to go off perfectly, Brother Marsh's plans would have to be executed within a single day, and they were already on the clock. Tau-9 had been charged with tracking down any new SCP-2662 cults and dismantling them, and Brother Marsh knew that it was only a matter of time before the Foundation tracked them down and did the same to them. If they wanted any chance of freeing the tentacled god, then they'd need to strike quickly and with overwhelming force. The SCP-2662 worshippers were able to secure the addresses of the five key Foundation personnel and station members outside each of them, including one who could realistically imitate each. They waited for night to fall and broke into each of their homes as they slept. What followed was a sequence of ruthless and efficient murders done in the cause of freeing their god. Dr. Gutierrez was shot in the head while he slept. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both stabbed to death before either even realized what was happening. Thompson, who'd gotten up to use the bathroom, went down in a hail of machine gun fire. Jillian Larson had seen that masked figures were breaking into her home and attempted to flee, but was caught and beaten to death by cultists in her hallway. It was a strange irony that people whose day jobs entailed working with some of the most dangerous and nightmarish anomalies imaginable were murdered in their homes by nothing more than regular humans. So far, Brother Marsh's plan had gone perfectly, with all five key personnel murdered within a two-minute period. Next, the selected doppelgangers stole clothes from their victims' closets and were handed the correct forged documentation. 
The next morning, each replacement began their journeys to the site where the tentacled god was being contained, while the rest of the cult armed themselves in preparation for their own part in the plan. Nobody at the Foundation seemed to notice anything amiss when the five arrived on site. When you work for the SCP Foundation, more mental energy is devoted to following the rules that keep you alive than to memorizing the faces of all your co-workers, and each one slipped neatly into position, disappearing into the familiarity of office life. But, infiltrating the site was one thing, getting past the belligerent bodyguards and into the cell of the tentacled god would be another thing entirely. That's where the rest of the cult would come into play. Heavily armed with whatever firearms they could get their hands on, the rest of the devotees of the tentacled god, Brother Marsh included, would attack the containment site head-on. In the ensuing chaos, the five cultists who had already infiltrated the site could take advantage of the distraction and break into the containment chamber. It was perfect. They launched their attack from the outside and from within. When Brother Marsh declared that the time was right, the assault began. A legion of gun-wielding cultists seemed to spring out of nowhere and started shooting up the warehouse that was a front for the containment site. The site quickly mobilized guards and task force members to take on the sudden threat, and just as Brother Marsh had anticipated, the site director called on the majority of Tau-9 to help repel the violent cultists from their perimeter. Tau-9 obeyed leaving three task force members behind to guard SCP-2662's containment chamber. They expected to be guarding the cell from rampaging religious zealots seeking an audience with their god. What they didn't expect was a group of five Foundation employees walking right up to them and opening fire, killing two Tau-9 members and taking the third as hostage. While the war was being waged outside, the infiltrators had found the tentacle god's containment cell in the low-risk humanoid ward. Their hostage insisted that using him wouldn't give them any leverage. The rest of his team would neutralize the whole group, him included, if that's what it took to stop them. The infiltrators explained that using him as leverage was never their intention. He wasn't a hostage at all. He was a sacrifice. The cultists of the tentacled god detonated explosives creating a hole in the wall and finally giving them access to their deity. They climbed through and gazed upon him in awe. There stood SCP-2662, twice as tall as a regular man, with ten huge tentacles emerging from its back. In their months of envisioning this creature, they pictured it sitting on a throne made of thousands of human bones, ready to dictate its commands to the obedient liberators. What they certainly didn't expect was to see the tentacled god hunched over a computer screen. Still, gods work in mysterious ways. So they stuck to the plan and began chanting. They pulled out a sacrificial dagger and began sacrificing their captured Tau-9 member. It was at this point that SCP-2662 turned and saw what they were doing with a look of pure horror. He rose up from his computer, his headphones getting caught as he did so. He told them to go away, that he didn't want them here and that the murdering people in his bedroom like this was inconsiderate and disgusting. The cultists became even more confused. Why wasn't their god accepting their offerings? What were they doing wrong? They tried more chanting and painting arcane symbols on the floor in blood, but this just seemed to make the creature angrier. He told them, in a tone more fitting for a teenage boy than a Lovecraftian god, to just leave him alone so he could play his video games. This was seriously not cool. The cultists were baffled. They told the tentacled god that they were there to free him. He replied that he didn't need saving, that crazy stalkers like them were why he turned himself into the Foundation in the first place. Before the cultist infiltrators could get another word in, the remaining members of Tau-9 stormed into the containment cell and gunned them down with surgical precision. The war outside was already over. Brother Marsh and the rest of the cultists were all killed in the firefight. Tau-9 didn't look the least bit surprised upon entering 2662's cell. This was a common occurrence, unfortunately. They had to deal with an attempted cult invasion every few months, because SCP-2662's main anomalous ability is inspiring violent cults who relentlessly track down and worship it with arcane and bloodthirsty rituals. The problem is, 2662 doesn't do this consciously, and definitely doesn't like the results. That's why he's under the voluntary care of the SCP Foundation, 
who keeps him amused with video games and reading material, while fending off the deranged cults who try to invade and abduct him. Following the termination of the devotees of the tentacled god, just one of many cults who'd broken into 2662's containment cell, the remaining Tau-9 members apologized to the tentacled creature for the disturbance, allowing him to return to his gaming. They assured him that it'd probably be at least a few more months before something like this happened again. SCP-2662's cell was repaired, and the Foundation returned to its task of seeking out would-be cult emancipators, because for the SCP Foundation, it's not always about the anomaly that's being kept in containment, but what's being kept out. Mobile Task Force Edna 84, also known by the codename and thus upon his crucible, is on one of the strangest missions they've ever been sent on. They sit in a darkened room, beads of sweat trickling down their brows. The lights of computer monitors shine upon their faces. They're tackling a monster that, if it escapes, will literally devour all of creation. It has no fear. It has no remorse. And if it isn't kept contained by Edna 84, it may escape and wreak havoc across the world. Oh, and did we mention it's trapped in a Minecraft server? You heard us right. SCP-4335 is a cognitohazardous extra-dimensional being of pure terror, trapped inside a procedurally generated world in the immensely popular game Minecraft. You hear about a lot of horrifying monsters being described as Lovecraftian, but only this monster is Minecraftian. There's a lot that needs explaining here, and we intend to get to all of it, but let's start with how the Foundation keeps this truly exceptional beast contained. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4335 back in 2010, shortly after the alpha version of Minecraft was released. Because of the online nature of the game, it's proven to be impossible to contain 4335 externally, seeing as it isn't confined to any one physical location. Shutting off the server 4335 is found in is not an effective containment method either, as this just causes the entity to simply hop to a different server. The Foundation's greatest fear is that 4335 will one day make the leap out of Minecraft and cause chaos in our world. That's why it's imperative to draft containment procedures for SCP-4335 within the game. This led to the creation of a containment site unlike any other. Site M1, the first official Foundation site made entirely out of Minecraft blocks. Everyone who was originally involved in the server has been removed and amnestatized. Since then, elite SCP Foundation containment specialists and gamers have been constructing the perfect prison for SCP-4335. Site M1 is a large stone complex built into the side of a mountain. It has a number of key features, including a supply area filled with materials vital for 4335's continued containment, chests filled with books that contain SCP-4335's containment procedures, a few animal farms for the purpose of breeding and killing livestock for their meat, the entrance to a mine, several chests containing books specifically designed for civilians to learn about 4335, if they ever breach containment and enter the server, and of course, the actual containment chamber for SCP-4335 itself, which is a little more complicated. 4335's containment chamber is built out of several layers, all made from iron blocks. The outermost cube is 75 by 75 by 75 blocks, the inner cube is 55 by 55 by 55 blocks, and the innermost cube is 25 by 25 by 25 blocks, creating several levels of defense. Finally, one layer within all these others which contains the anomaly proper is made from obsidian blocks. SCP-4335 is bound into the center of the containment chamber with a complex mechanism. The outermost cube is completely filled with water, and several dispensers capable of rapidly dispensing large amounts of items in a short amount of time line the cube. The cube also contains several mob farms, which are devices that constantly spawn enemies into the chamber that drop loot when they die. The chamber is essentially designed to funnel a constant flow of items inwards to SCP-4335. There are even contingency measures for if SCP-4335 manages to breach containment. If escape is attempted, blocks of TNT detonate above the ceiling, causing lava to pour into the chamber. At that point, MTF Edna-84 are dispatched into the server to lure 4335 back into its containment chamber 
To do this, they fire a mix of fire-resistant potions and ender pearls, which have teleportation capabilities. Interestingly, there's one more basic method of luring SCP-4335 back into the Obsidian Cube, taunting and insulting. One of SCP-4335's many anomalous abilities is being able to hear people through the screen and being a proud creature. It often responds to insults by charging in to directly engage the insulter. If SCP-4335 still manages to breach the containment that has been set up for it, then they even expect that it will likely soon hop into another server. At that point, the goal will shift to finding the monster and recontaining it. With containment procedures this complex and extensive, it shouldn't come as a surprise that SCP-4335 rests firmly in the Keter class. What exactly is this anomalous entity? Why does its containment hinge on constantly providing it with items? And how did it end up in Mojang's popular building and survival game in the first place? SCP-4335, in terms of physical dimensions, appears almost identical to the player character, with an all-black skin. It also appears to be constantly shrouded in a cloud of smoke particles, and has long black tendrils protruding from its back. In some respects, 4335 has been compared to two popular creepypasta figures, Herobrine and the Slenderman. But 4335 is far stranger. Its physical body behaves similarly to most assets native to the game, with a few peculiar, anomalous abilities we'll discuss soon. Handling SCP-4335 is an extremely delicate process. If command blocks, creative mode, or server commands are ever enabled in a server with SCP-4335, the server will instantly shut down, and SCP-4335 will move to a different server. SCP-4335 also uses its tendrils to destroy surrounding blocks before consuming them. With each successful consumption, SCP-4335 grows, and when it reaches sufficient size, it hops to a different server. As you can see, keeping SCP-4335 contained is an uphill battle, but luckily there are two factors on the Foundation's side here. The first is that SCP-4335 is immobilized while consuming items and blocks, limiting its ability to actively escape Foundation forces. The second factor is that SCP-4335 needs a rest period between consuming blocks in order to grow, meaning if its consumption is constant and continuous, it isn't able to grow. These two factors have informed the entirety of the Foundation's containment procedures around SCP-4335. It's locked into its chamber and fed items and blocks constantly, effectively rooting it in place. When SCP-4335 begins to grow, the Foundation also found that the application of Ender Pearls helps reduce it back to its normal size. However, SCP-4335 does have a method of striking back against its captors. 4335 is a virgin-class multisensory cognito hazard. Anyone viewing it without proper training and protection may experience distressing hallucinations. SCP-4335 is also capable of telepathic speech, with people playing on its server, and as we alluded to earlier, it can also hear any noises you make while playing. Weird is a term thrown around a lot when it comes to SCPs, considering it's pretty much a requirement for the Foundation to take interest in you. But an all-devouring Minecraft demon that can hear you talking through your screen is strange, even by Foundation standards. MTF Edna84 first discovered SCP-4335 in the single-player server of Minecraft user Leaking Heart. Three team members, Jason Yelsen, Richard Duchamp, and Shelia Freemason, covertly entered the game to investigate and potentially apprehend the creature. When Leaking Heart first discovered their presence on what he thought was a private server, he quickly left, a little creeped out by the sudden intrusion. Thankfully, the trio was still able to locate SCP-4335. They discovered the creature hiding inside a giant crater, as though it had impacted the Earth at considerable speed. Richard Duchamp, who was the leader of the team at the time, made the mistake of looking directly at the entity. In that moment, he experienced the full force of SCP-4335's cognitohazardous effects. He hallucinated, believing that his keyboard was melting before his eyes. In the aftermath of this incident, Duchamp was taken off the case, and Jason Yelsen was promoted to head of the project. Things were still going to get stranger. 
Yeltsin was able to open a dialogue with the creature after containing it in a chamber filled with lava. It asked him whether it had landed in the right location, meaning our world, and Yeltsin informed him that it had somehow fallen into the world of Minecraft instead. The creature was at first confused, and then angry and resentful about its situation. It vowed to find its way into our world somehow, and obtain more sustenance. A few months after this, the entity managed to breach containment and hop into another server. Yeltsin and two others once again managed to track it down and recontain it, but this time two civilians also inhabiting the server were exposed to the anomalous effects of SCP-4335. They weren't hurt, but they did appear strange and incoherent after experiencing 4335's cognito hazards. The Foundation tracked them down in the aftermath and gave them amnestic treatment. 4335 was contained shortly thereafter. Once again, Yeltsin came face to face with his new foe. Eight months after being captured, 4335 granted Yeltsin another interview from containment. 4335 admitted that it almost respected Yeltsin and the rest of the Foundation for figuring out how to capture and contain it so quickly. In exchange, it would give the Foundation something extremely valuable, information. First, it asked one question of Yeltsin. How does he define creation? Yeltsin replied, Uh, something that is built and brought into this universe by a sapient being using other things from this universe? 4335 agreed. It went on to explain that it came from a universe devoid of creation, a dark and unknowable place, filled with nothing but violent random chaos. Its dimension existed directly above ours, and it often looked down at us through a dimensional window, fascinated by all the creation below. It plotted and dreamed to one day infiltrate our reality, and Yeltsin finally had the opportunity to ask the magic question, why? Though he wasn't quite ready for the brutal honesty of SCP-4335's reply. I do not like to lie, so I will tell you now. I wish to suck it dry of the toys of whatever force controls your universe. Destroy the light, destroy the earth, and destroy humanity. It reminded me of me. A blubbering mass of intelligence and order. It sickens me in ways I cannot comprehend. I hope you understand. SCP-4335 was a connoisseur of creation, and it sought to devour all of it. In this moment, Yeltsin realized what an incredibly dangerous entity he was dealing with. The only mystery was why this creature had somehow landed in Minecraft instead of our world, which appeared to be the only thing that saved us. But Yeltsin didn't have time to think. 4335 was about to stage another daring escape attempt. One of its tendrils reached out and attacked Yeltsin's player character. In that moment, the real-life Yeltsin began to hallucinate and panic. Suddenly back in the game, a series of abnormally tall, slender black figures appeared and began deconstructing the containment chamber around SCP-4335. It had somehow summoned new minions into the game to assist in this containment breach. Jason Yeltsin entered Cognito Hazard Quarantine following this incident and was removed from the project, and he wasn't the only one affected by this incident. Following the first appearance of these long, dark figures, players across the globe began to experience them appearing in their own games. The Foundation managed to find a solution. They contacted Mojang and had the creatures patched into the game during the next update, as a new non-anomalous entity, which seemed to stop 4335 from being able to use them as its own tools. They're now known as the Endermen, and are beloved among fans for being one of the creepier enemies. To this day, containment efforts continue for SCP-4335, but there's only one question left. Why did the entity fall into Minecraft rather than our world? The file posits the most likely answer, because 4335 defines creation as elements made by sapient beings. In Minecraft, the most popular game in the world at the height of 4335's power, everything that exists is the product of code made by humans. Creation is truly abundant there. As for our world, in SCP-4335's extra-dimensional eyes, 
There is no creation, no intelligent design, no soothing piano soundtrack just frightening chaotic randomness which is too unlike its own dimension. So even if SCP-4335 ever did arrive in our reality, it would likely be disappointed by how little there is to eat. The fabric of our world is littered with strange doorways if you know where to look for them. Tears, portals, anomalies, all leading to places and planes beyond human imagining and understanding. And SCP-2317, otherwise known as a door to another world, certainly fits that description. Contained and kept at all times under the watch of armed guards, SCP-2317 appears to be a simple and unsuspecting wooden door in its frame. It hardly looks like it requires such extreme round-the-clock security, or needs a strange secretive ritual that the Foundation performs, presumably to keep the door closed. But of course, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed doorway isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. Even by the Foundation's already high standards, the requirements and regulations for personnel who are assigned to SCP-2317 seem oddly specific. Psychological testing is standard practice to work for the Foundation, but an additional hurdle that anyone has to clear before even getting to glimpse at this unassuming wooden door is having a score of at least 72 on the Milgram Obedience Examination. It is also mandatory that personnel assigned to maintaining it are both unmarried, with no children or next of kin, as well as an unwavering, unquestioning loyalty to the Foundation, pure devotion to its code and objectives. These may seem like strange requirements. After all, SCP-2317 is just a door, isn't it? Perhaps there's a reason that the Foundation keeps so much of the information about SCP-2317 buried deep under layers upon layers of security, with only the Overseer Council privy to the full details of its strange nature. Knowledge, as they say, is power. But maybe knowing too much about whatever is behind that door can prove deadly. Still, if SCP-2317 is a door to another world, an alternate dimension or parallel reality, it must be safe enough to visit. After all, the Foundation has been sending personnel in there on a regular basis. Daily, in fact. According to the O5 Council, this is done as part of a procedure to maintain active containment of… something lurking beyond that old wooden doorframe. But what could possibly warrant such constant maintenance and surveillance? In accordance with the Foundation's guidelines, all staff are required to rotate out of observing SCP-2317 after every two months, and spend the following third month in full psychological counseling, before they are permitted to return to the containment unit housing the door to another world. It was after one of these month-long periods of evaluation that a Foundation guard was informed that his security clearance has been raised to level 3, and that he'd been selected for the duty of carrying out 220 Calabasas. He knew the name instantly. This was the title given to the daily containment procedure that absolutely had to be carried out. The guard didn't question these orders. After all, he'd been selected precisely because of his loyalty to the Foundation. He did make one request to his commanding officer, however. He wanted to know what had happened to the last guard that had performed the procedure. Didn't make it out of psychological evaluation, the officer replied. Not letting this affect his dedication, the guard was told to prepare for Procedure 220 Calabasas. Along with a fellow member of Foundation security personnel, the guard was instructed to gather everything on a strange list. The first was a pre-selected member of Class D personnel, specifically a convicted murderer. Class D refers to disposable class personnel, expendable individuals recruited by the Foundation for the sole purpose of testing SCPs. Class Ds were usually prison inmates repurposed for SCP testing, and the one chosen for 220 Calabasas was no exception, serving multiple life sentences for murders, or at least that's what the guard had been told. A Foundation personnel member instructed him to refer to the Class Ds solely as the assistant from that point on. Next, the guard collected a live chicken, an obsidian edged knife, a silver aspergillum and aspersorium, to be filled with 500 cc's of holy water, that have been blessed by a priest of the Abrahamic faith, and finally, a one kiloton nuclear device, which according to instructions, was only to be detonated in the unlikely event of a catastrophic containment failure, 
In other words, the last resort. After following his instructions to the letter and without question, the guard and his colleague were briefed. The Foundation personnel member informed them that he'd be joining and leading them in the procedure. The staff member also specified that henceforth he'd be referred to as the celebrant until the completion of 220 Calabasas. The guard was acutely aware of how specific these instructions were, but trusted in the Foundation. Knowing that if they wanted this procedure performed a certain way, then it was in everyone's best interest to carry out the orders to the letter. But what the celebrant then went on to explain raised far more questions about SCP-2317 and the nature of Procedure 220 Calabasas. The Class D joining them wasn't actually a Class D. The assistant, as they were now referred to, was in reality another Foundation staff member with a Level 4 security clearance specifically tailored to SCP-2317. Every member of staff entering through SCP-2317 and taking an active role in 22 Calabasas needed to be informed that this assistant was not to be harmed or treated as a member of Disposable Class. Fighting back the nagging question of why the Foundation would employ this subterfuge, the guard, along with his fellow security officer, the celebrant, and assistant, prepared for their departure through the door to another world at solar noon, when the sun was highest over SCP-2317. Solar noon, chickens, and holy water. This all seemed like an oddly occult combination for the Foundation. As they entered the old wooden door, beyond lay a barren salt plain, stretching out for kilometers in every direction. This alternate dimension, according to the briefing, was designated SCP-2317 Prime. The guard immediately noticed a ring of seven pillars directly ahead of the group as they entered, each of them bearing intricately detailed engravings unlike anything from any era of ancient history. Procedure 220 Calabasas was carried out quickly but carefully, the guard watching as the celebrant and assistant were careful not to miss a step. First, the celebrant scattered holy water into the center of the pillars with the Aspergillum and Aspersorium, looking down at his feet and keeping a steady pace as he stepped counterclockwise around them. The guard watched intently as the celebrant completed his circuit around the pillars and turned to the assistant, anointing his head with holy water. Seven seals, seven rings, seven thrones for the Scarlet King, he said aloud. The assistant, with the obsidian blade in his hand, took the chicken and dispatched it in sacrifice, letting its blood mix with the holy water. He then repeated the celebrant's circuit in the opposite direction, before stepping into the center of the stone pillars. Blood for the old gods, water for the new king, the assistant recited, pouring the remaining mix of blood and holy water over a patch of salt in the middle of the seven pillars. Even though he knew it wasn't his place to question the foundation, as the 220 Calabasas procedure took place, the guard couldn't help but wonder what all of this was for. It seemed so… ritualistic, like something deeply religious or even magical. He never bought into all that occult mumbo-jumbo, even while working for the Foundation, but he had learned not to question anything, even the strangest and most inexplicable of sights. Little did he know that beneath his feet, was an ancient and unknowable horror, a beast chained and lying in wait. Contained in a chamber directly underneath the pillars sat an impossibly large creature. Humanoid and obese, its body covered entirely in scales thicker than armor plating. Branch-like horns protruded from its jawless head, pointing up to chains that hung from the seven pillars above. Each one hooked into the entity's back. All but one of the chains was broken, a final withering shackle keeping the devourer of worlds in its underground prison. Ever since 1894 BCE, when Arikshian mystics imprisoned it, the devourer has been waiting patiently for its inevitable freedom. It knows, as well as the Foundation, that nothing can be done to prevent the final chain from one day breaking. Even Procedure 220 Calabasas won't keep the creature contained. It's nothing more than a smokescreen, an act designed to create an illusion of active containment and maintain Foundation morale until a permanent solution can be devised to keep SCP-2317 imprisoned. Of course, if the guard had known this, it would have also explained the need for a one-kiloton nuclear device as part of this staged ritual. 
Procedure 220 Calabasas had all the components to trick everyone below the O5 Council. Emulating religious and occult rituals, the increased level of security surrounding the procedure and its purpose, and telling staff that any failure to correctly and completely perform the 220 Calabasas procedure will result in an XK class end of the world scenario. All these elements work together to conceal the truth that one day the devourer will escape and lay waste to our dimension. Knowledge is power and maybe knowing too much truly is deadly. Perhaps if the guard had learned any of this, he'd have understood why his predecessor never made it out of psychological evaluation. Maybe if he had questioned the purpose of Procedure 220 Calabasas, he'd have learned the true nature of SCP-2317 and what that doorway kept out. But he was loyal to the Foundation through and through. As the team finished performing 220 Calabasas and returned through the wooden door, the guard took one last glance over his shoulder at the vast salt plain. The entire dimension was calm, silent, but not peaceful. It was patient. The entity had waited centuries for its time, and now all it would take was the breaking of this seventh and final chain. One day. The door was closed behind the guard as he, the celebrant, the assistant, and his fellow security officers stepped back through their work done and, as far as they knew, preventing catastrophe for another day. Only the Foundation higher-ups, the Overseer Council, are aware of the true danger posed by SCP-2317 and its sole inhabitant. Current predictions are that at some point within the next 30 years, the Devourer of Worlds will be freed. Any and all attempts to repair or recreate the chains holding it in place have so far failed. As such, the O5 Council has elected to continue providing Foundation personnel with the ignorant hope that Procedure 220 Calabasas is an effective strategy for containment. As we've said, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed door isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. In the case of SCP-2317, the unassuming wooden door holds at bay an ancient creature of untold power that will one day break free and wreak havoc in our dimension. Nothing the Foundation does can prevent it, or keep it contained behind the door to another world. And only the Overseer Council knows that any and all efforts to do so are futile. With all that in mind, we can only hope that the doorway of SCP-2317 stays closed, at least for a little while longer. It was November 20th, 2019, and the helicopter circled far above in the freezing wind of the Antarctic. SCP Foundation Site Director Jason Monroe looked down at the isolated, mm. above-ground facilities of Provisional Site 344-1. Something about this place made him nervous, edgy, and for good reason. Between 2003 and 2019, 29 mobile task force units and 73 members of D-Class personnel had gone missing here and never been found. Monroe thought he was here for a routine investigation into negligence and mismanagement, but little did he know, he was in for so much more. This is the story of SCP-5545 and one man's journey into his own worst nightmare, literally. But this nightmare began a long time ago, 300 years to be exact. And like most nightmares, it started as a dream. That dream was one of expansion. National powers across Europe wanted to be the first to conquer the globe and expand into new territories, and sent countless exploratory missions off into the unknown to achieve this goal. Any history book will tell you that the first outsiders to lay eyes upon the continent of Antarctica did so in 1820. The reality is that the first ones to get there actually landed in the late 1700s. The hapless explorers ventured into mainland Antarctica and made base camps before searching and digging for any useful resources nearby. They came upon a strange discovery, a hallway hidden beneath the ice. Not a passage in the ice, but a true hallway, complete with light fixtures. The confused explorers ventured down into these impossible hallways and for many of them, it would be the last thing they ever did. No matter how long they walked, it seemed like the hallways just kept going. As they continued to walk for hours, they hoped to find something, anything, and eventually, 
They did. They passed from these hallways into somewhere different altogether, and most of them were never heard from again. Those who did manage to escape often died or took their own lives soon after. Whatever it was they discovered down there, they didn't want to live with it on their minds. It's believed that over 70 colonial explorers disappeared or died this way, and that most who found these endless hallways beneath the Antarctic ice never returned. The multiple anomalous objects and phenomena that make up SCP-5545 came into the Foundation's hands several centuries later, on September 18, 2003, when during an expedition into the Antarctic, they too found the endless hallways. The Foundation built Provisional Site 344-1 around them, hoping to safely seal them off from any other unwitting Antarctic explorers or researchers. But there was something else lurking beneath the ice in Antarctica, something dangerous. The hallways were designated as SCP-5545-1 and were thought to be the extent of the anomalous activity at the site. But soon SCP-5545-2 was discovered, which resulted in the deaths of 16 researchers. So what exactly is 5545-2? It's an entity so volatile that even knowing about it is considered to be a containment breach. And as a result, it's kept in Provisional Site 344-2. Unlike Site 344-1, 344-2 isn't a physical space. It's conceptual, accessible only through the endless hallways, created with the express purpose of keeping 5545-1 and 5545-2 separate. Why? Because whenever the two come into contact, the result is 5545-3, the network of endless hallways expanding. If they remained in contact, the hallways would continue to expand and the entire planet could be filled with endless hallways in just four to six hours. While the two are apart though, 5545-3 reverses, but it always would take just a few hours to throw the whole world into a chaos of infinite hallways. SCP-5545 has been given the classification safe, Wait, we're dealing with a mysterious and volatile anomaly that claimed a huge number of lives and still somehow eludes true Foundation understanding, yet the official SCP Foundation classification is safe? How could this be? Monroe was the director of Site 58 and was the definition of no nonsense. Prior to taking the site director position, he was a decorated member of Mobile Task Force Ada 10 and helped contain numerous Keter class anomalies. He'd been around the proverbial block when it came to anomalous activity, and something about SCP-5545 and the management of Provisional Site 344 seemed awfully suspicious to him, and he had questions. Like how such an unpredictable anomaly could be declared safe, and why had there been such a lapse of communication between the Foundation and Dr. Gabriel Reed, who'd been running the facility for the past two decades, and most of all, just what exactly was the mysterious SCP-5545-2? Monroe started to believe that something terrible had happened at the site, and Reed was covering it all up. But to find out for sure, he'd need to go to Antarctica and investigate it himself. Information about this supposedly safe anomaly was highly classified. Those without O5 clearance could face termination for snooping. But that didn't scare Jason Monroe. He dealt with Ketters before. He could deal with this. Or... So he thought. Monroe submitted a request and was granted unanimous approval by the O5 Council to travel to Provisional Site 344 and get to the bottom of this mystery. He took a chopper to the base soon after, armed with a concealed firearm and a hostile meme detector, or HMD, to test whether the base and its staff had somehow fallen under a hazardous mimetic effect from SCP-5545. He'd find the answers, or die trying. The moment Monroe arrived, he couldn't help but notice the strange way the staff behaved. They seemed listless, almost oppressive. When he showed his credentials to a researcher, they simply said, SCP-5545-2 is contained in Site 344-2. His request to see Dr. Reed that night was denied. Dr. Reed was busy, he was told. Wait until tomorrow. The next day, Dr. Monroe met with Dr. Reed, but the results of the meeting were underwhelming, to say the least. Just like the rest of the staff on the site, he seemed exhausted, as though he hadn't slept in days. His responses were quiet and evasive, and he refused to tell Monroe anything that wasn't in the official files already. Monroe ran the conversation through the HMD and found nothing out of the ordinary. What was going on here? Monroe was irritated, but not deterred. Nothing would stop him from finding out the truth. The next day, 
He flexed his O5 credentials and hacked into the base's security system. This gave him access to cameras around Site-344-1, but more importantly, there was a single camera inside the mysterious Site-344-2. Jackpot. But when he looked at it, the feed was an entirely black screen with the words SCP-5545-2 is contained in Site-344-2. The footage of the staff in 344-1 was equally mm -hmm. strange. The 18 employees on site all sat at computer banks, with nothing but static playing on their screens. Monroe kept digging, though, and was able to hack into the security footage of Dr. Reed's office. As he watched, he discovered a 15-minute period where Reed left the office each day. He could use this brief window to break in and collect more intel on SCP-5545-2. Monroe was so wrapped up in the investigation that he almost forgot the more immediate danger around him and nearly mm. wandered into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 by mistake. He made a note to be more careful in the future. His first attempt at breaking into Dr. Reed's office didn't produce many answers. One piece of evidence was a blurry picture of what looked like a mobile task force entering a 5545-1 hallway in the dark. Another was a spreadsheet featuring all the personnel, living or dead, who worked at the site, but one name and the details of whether this person was alive or dead was completely redacted. Anything particularly juicy was hidden behind O5 clearance. If Monroe wanted the answers, he needed to break through. That night, he had a horrific reoccurring nightmare, one that had plagued him since he joined MTF ETA-10. He dreamed that he was in a fancy dining room with a grand fireplace. The room was full of statues of men and women. The men looked angry, and the women looked afraid. As he approached the fireplace, the ceiling extended infinitely up into the darkness. Suddenly, the zombie-like body of a teenage girl appears in the fireplace, hanging from a long thread. Her eyes look furious and full of rage, and Monroe somehow knows that he's the reason for her hate. When he steps into the fireplace in this dream, she attacks him. The two intertwine, and they burn forever. The one difference was that in this new iteration of the dream, he blinked upon entering the fireplace, and suddenly he was in the hallway. He awoke sure that something was terribly wrong here, but he couldn't give up now. The next day, Dr. Monroe broke into Reed's office and made a horrifying discovery. He found files indicating that Dr. Reed was knowingly sending mobile task forces and D-class personnel into the infinite hallways of 5545-1 to their doom. He also found evidence that Reed and the researchers had been spying on him, somehow intercepting copies of the notes he had been taking. That's when Dr. Reed entered the office and interrupted him. Monroe panicked and drew his weapon, holding the doctor at gunpoint. He was breaking so many Foundation rules, but right now, he feared for his life. The doctor seemed unbothered by Monroe's threats, though. He told Monroe that everything was going to plan, and that he should go back to his room. Monroe was becoming increasingly paranoid. He felt that at any moment, guards might burst in and execute him. Nothing about this place made sense. He worried he was going insane. Perhaps the only way to find answers was to go even deeper. To risk it all and venture through the endless hallways to find SCP-5545-2 himself and finally discover what this thing actually was. Monroe left his room and stepped into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 that was located just across from his dorm. He found that it was a hallway like all the others on site, plain, concrete, worn of age, with simple light fixtures on the walls. He walked for hours, recording with a concealed device. The light suddenly went out, leaving him in complete darkness. When they flicked back on, he was in a very different environment. A grand, old carpeted hallway, the kind you'd see in an old mansion. He broke into a cold sweat. What was so familiar about this place? He kept walking, racked with terror, until this new hallway finally led him to the place he'd been seeking. Site 344-2, the domain of 5545-2. It was a large, poorly lit room, filled with grimacing statues and a large fireplace at the far end. It was the exact same room from Monroe's dream, with one horrifying difference. Monroe noticed a single white thread hanging down from the infinite ceiling, and when he looked up to find its source, he screamed. There were hundreds of bodies hanging and swinging from the ceiling above him. Everyone who SCP-5545-2 had ever killed, including MTF members, D-class personnel, 
and even the colonial explorers from hundreds of years before. And all of them were him, every single one. They had his face, and there, hanging in the middle of the room at ground level, was the body of a teenage girl, the one from his dream. In that moment, he finally recognized her. She was the girl he killed, the first him, hundreds of years ago. Much like Monroe, you're probably wondering, what is going on here? Thanks to declassified communication between Dr. Reed and the O5 Council, we can tell you. Jason Monroe was a man who's been reincarnated hundreds of times over the last 300 years, ever since he murdered a teenage girl, a girl named Emily, his daughter. This murder sparked the existence of SCP-5545 as an eternally reoccurring punishment for his crimes. Since figuring this out, the Foundation has kept tabs on Monroe's reincarnations, whether they're MTF members, D-Class personnel, or even site directors. They see to it that these reincarnations always find their way back to 5545-2 to take his punishment and prevent the infinite hallway expansion that threatens to destroy the world. It's a plan everyone is in on, everyone except him. But every time he enters that nightmare haunting room, it all comes rushing back. In that moment though, he knew his crime, and he somehow knew how many times this punishment had unfolded for him. He now had two choices. Repent and accept the punishment again, or leave and activate 5545-3, potentially allowing the endless tunnels to expand across the world. Like his many predecessors, Monroe made the decent choice. He accepted his punishment and allowed his own string to coil around him as the lights in the room went off, one by one, leaving only darkness. Jason Monroe, that version of him, at least, was never seen again. But the SCP Foundation is already eyeing up his next reincarnation and preparing to let this twisted cycle play out all over again. Are you sitting comfortably? We know a good chair is hard to find, Maybe you're watching this on your phone while you lie in bed. Or maybe you're watching at your desk, sitting in an office chair. Maybe you're even watching it while you're in the bathroom. It's fine, we're not here to judge. For our money, you just can't beat a nice, classic wooden chair with soft leather upholstery. Call us old-fashioned, but some things just never go out of style. Take a chair like SCP-1609, for example. This fine piece of mahogany was once a chair that simply couldn't be beat in its quest to bring its users a little dose of comfort and refinement in their daily life. Tell us, have you ever been on your feet all day just walking and walking and walking and at a certain point you're just begging for a nice comfy chair that'll let you take the weight off your feet for a little while? You would have been SCP-1609's favorite kind of person. After all, it was the only chair that literally sought out weary travelers, and even did you the courtesy of tucking itself in. That's not a metaphor either. SCP-1609 could literally teleport to nearby people who needed to sit down and didn't have a chair to fulfill that desire. It was nothing but a nice, helpful anomaly that wanted to help people rest when they needed it most. The more observant members of you have noticed that we've been using the past tense so far. That's because while SCP-1609 is still an active anomaly, it isn't a chair anymore. And this transformation wasn't something that SCP-1609 planned, anticipated, or even wanted. The story of 1609's transformation even strikes to the core of one of the Foundation's oldest and most bitterly held rivalries with another group of interest. It's the tale of how a helpful piece of anomalous furniture became a paranoid killer. But first we need to talk about containment procedures. Like a word you see so often that it starts to lose meaning, containment and specific containment procedures are concepts so integral to the very existence of the SCP Foundation that it is easy to overlook or forget about them. They're one of the three core pillars of the Foundation's mission statement. Secure. Contain. Protect. Because of the centrality of containment to the Foundation's core principles, one of the most valuable roles on the SCP Foundation payroll is that of the Containment Specialist, a vast team of experts who work with researchers to figure out the best way to keep every anomaly contained, based on their unique abilities and attributes. They're zookeepers, archivists, guards, security and intelligence experts, 
magicians, practitioners of ritual, scientists, and so much more. In short, they're anything they need to be in order to adapt to the ever-evolving containment needs of the anomalies they keep under lock and key. And containment isn't easy. Aside from the rare safe class SCPs, which require incredibly minimal containment resources, the containment of most SCPs extracts some kind of cost, whether that be financial, time, effort, or in some particularly dark cases, human life. Some SCPs like SCP-974 and SCP-2845 require the sacrifice of human children to prevent worse fates befalling many others. Other SCPs, like the infamous SCP-231, require the Foundation to do horrifying things to the SCP itself to prevent it from manifesting some even more horrifying anomalous traits. And a third but equally inconvenient kind of SCP, like SCP-682 and SCP-076, require huge numbers of heavily armed guards with powerful weapons to keep their deadly prisoners locked away, often at a massive risk to their own lives. Containment isn't easy, but it's ultimately the very thing that makes the SCP Foundation the organization it is. If they were instead on a quest to kill and destroy every anomaly they could get their hands on, then they'd be the Global Occult Coalition, the UN's answer to the SCP Foundation that prefers to seek, disable, and destroy rather than secure, contain, and protect. It's the primary characteristic that differentiates these two titans of the anomalous world who regularly come to blows. And right at the heart of that difference is SCP-1609. As we mentioned earlier, SCP-1609 went through a transformation that changed everything. But the SCP Foundation never actually knew about the anomaly prior to that transformation taking place. It first came to their attention when it literally manifested within a containment cell in Storage Site-08 making the rare move of willingly submitting itself to the Foundation containment. But what showed up in that cell certainly wasn't a chair. When 1609 appeared, all it looked like was a pile of trash, specifically splinters, wood chippings, furniture nails, and scraps of bleached leather and fabric. Anything that suddenly infiltrates a secure Foundation containment site is cause for concern, even a bunch of wood scraps. So the site director sent in an armed guard to investigate the mysterious pile of debris. Researchers watching over a surveillance feed were surprised when the guard suddenly entered a state of heightened distress. He fell to his knees, coughing and spluttering until he expelled a considerable amount of blood from his mouth and nose. He then collapsed on the ground next to the pile of debris, dead. An investigation following this incident found that the guard had died after a sudden influx of jagged metal and wood had teleported inside of him, tearing his lungs apart from the inside and causing the guard to die a painful and horrific death. Naturally, the site personnel were somewhat concerned by this development. They sent in a D-Class to investigate further, but were surprised to find that the D-Class in question was somehow completely fine. The pile of debris that would soon be designated SCP-1609 made no attempt to harm the D-Class as it had the guard, and finding out why this was the case came as a side effect of figuring out exactly what had happened to SCP-1609. Through a rigorous investigation involving more than one secret Foundation mole, they discovered that SCP-1609 had previously been in the possession of, you guessed it, the Global Occult Coalition. Back then, it was just a helpful chair you once knew and loved, until the GOC had the bright idea of forcing it into a wood chipper in order to destroy it due to its connection to someone called the Carpenter. But all the GOC's attempt actually succeeded in doing was altering its form and completely changing its personality. To put it in simple terms, SCP-1609 is now a pile of possibly sentient teleporting wood and metal chippings that suffers from a nasty case of PTSD. The incident with the wood chipper traumatized SCP-1609, and its anxiety is triggered by anything that reminds it of the GOC or the wood chipper incident. This includes wearing formal clothing, lab coats, protective clothing, jumpsuits, and particularly body armor but also includes anyone carrying weapons, appearing outwardly aggressive using common GOC lingo, or even mentioning the GOC in SCP-1609's proximity. 
If any of this happens, it's extremely likely that SCP-1609 will resort to its only natural defense mechanism, which is teleporting its debris into the lungs of anyone it considers to be a threat. The guard had received this grisly punishment because his clothes, weapon, and overall manner caused SCP-1609 to regard him as a threat and react accordingly. You may think this is overkill on 1609's part, but if you were just trying to help out the chairless people of the world and someone fed you into a wood chipper, you'd probably be a little jumpy too. Since these early days, the Foundation has learned to apply a more tender touch when it comes to dealing with SCP-1609, and the brilliant containment specialists even figured out a way to keep 1609 happily contained by placing it in a flower bed inside its containment chamber where its wood chips get to serve as mulch for a variety of flowers and plants. All attending researchers and guards dress in plain clothes and adopt a loose, pleasant attitude while inside. Whenever they're around, they make a point of saying how beautiful the flower bed is, so that the disfigured anomaly that only ever wanted to be helpful can still feel like it's doing something nice. Because of these containment procedures, breaches involving SCP-1609 have remained in the single digits. It is a perfect example of less really being more when it comes to containment. The head researcher on the SCP-1609 case, Dr. Sievert, released an internal document permanently affixed to the file like a kind of cautionary signpost. It's a clear expression of exasperation and rage at the actions of the Global Occult Coalition, reading, SCP-1609 represents a perfect example of the flaws inherent in the operating procedure of the GOC, and serves as a cautionary tale for any members of the Foundation who disagree with our practices on containing dangerous objects. Prior to the Coalition getting their hands on this, it was perfectly harmless. A chair which teleports to you when you need to see it is normal compared to most of the stuff that we deal with on a regular basis. When they put it through a wood chipper, it got hurt, scared, and angry, so it lashed out at them. By trying to protect the world by destroying it, they inadvertently made the situation a whole lot worse. SCP-1609 went from being harmless to deadly in the space of a few minutes because of the GOC and we had to clean up the mess. Thankfully, SCP-1609 is pretty simple for us to deal with, so long as we don't have to do anything stupid around it. It won't fight back and it won't try to leave. Even if it does, it usually comes back, and I think I've worked out why. It came to us because it was afraid of the people who had hurt it. That's why it always comes back. It's afraid of the rest of the world now, and it's looking to us for protection. This is why we have special containment procedures instead of special destruction procedures. If you break something, it's broken forever. When you try to destroy an anomaly, you can't take back your mistakes. That's what SCP-1609 has to tell us. This is why we're right and the GOC is wrong, people. But of course, there are two sides to every story, and it's important to understand the GOC's perspective on this whole mess. To them, this has never been SCP-1609. It's KTE-0937 Velveteen, aka the Sixth Chair. It was labeled as the Sixth because for the GOC, this chair was merely one part of a wider investigation. It belonged to a six-piece furniture set created by a dangerous anomalous person of interest named the Carpenter for a classified customer. The GOC was able to intercept this deal and kill the Carpenter and his customer in the process. After that, all that was left was to eliminate the anomalous objects, and five of them were incinerated without incident. However, before they could do the same to the sixth chair, they experienced an incinerator malfunction. Rather than just waiting for the incinerator to be fixed, a member of GOC personnel decided to rush the job and run the chair through a wood chipper. It was at this point that its pieces first lashed out invading the lungs of this negligent GOC member along with five others, killing them all. It was shortly after that that SCP-1609 manifested in Foundation containment. Much like Dr. Sievert did for the Foundation, Assistant Director Kipling, one of the GOC's Legion of Middle Managers, affixed a note to the profile of KTE-0937 Velveteen that reads, KTE-0937 Velveteen is an object lesson in the importance of following proper operating procedures. Due to the lack of vigilance by the agent on the scene, the object's threat level was escalated. The object itself was not successfully disposed of, and it has since fallen into the hands of a hostile agency. A single failure by a single operative resulted in the deaths of six. Remember this next time you think about cutting corners. And that's a good lesson for everyone. 
Whether you're trying to destroy an anomalous piece of furniture or keeping its remains happy so they don't try to kill you, cutting corners is always a fast track to failure. Joseph and Frank were two lifelong squatchers. No, that isn't an insult. That's a self-given title for Bigfoot enthusiasts who are willing to head out into the woods and search for the legendary Sasquatch firsthand. While most Squatchers will go their whole lives without ever encountering one, Joseph and Frank were about to get lucky. They just didn't know what kind of luck. During a journey through the forests of the Pacific Northwest, Frank spotted something moving in the distance. A huge ape-like creature with grayish fur and human-like movements. Frank thought he was finally laying eyes on the mighty Bigfoot after decades of searching. What he didn't know was that he just made a deadly mistake. He had looked directly at SCP-1000, and there would be terrible consequences. Frank was excited. He just achieved the life goal of any Squatcher. He tapped Joseph on the shoulder and directed him to look in the direction of the creature. Joseph followed Frank's direction and stared into the distance. When his eyes finally came into focus on the ape-like beast, he froze. His brain just short-circuited. One second he was about to encounter the holy grail of his hobby, and the next he was literally brain dead. Joseph collapsed. In the distance, the ape-like creature disappeared back into the woods. Not that Frank even noticed. He was too busy trying to wake Joseph, but it was no use. Joseph was gone, and Frank had no idea why. The headlines read, Bigfoot killed my friend. Most people either ignored it or laughed it off. Just a couple of cranks goofing off in a forest and one of them had dropped dead. Who cares? Well, one organization cared. The SCP Foundation. Mobile Task Force Zeta-1000. The Foundation's specialized SCP-1000 detail were alerted to the reports. They sprang into action, tracking down and detaining Frank for questioning. They process a million loony Bigfoot lovers every year and usually find nothing. But the death of Frank's friend made it all too clear. They hadn't encountered a Bigfoot, but a real, genuine example of SCP-1000. SCP-1000 rarely ranks among the scariest or most dangerous SCPs, but underestimating the creature is a terrible mistake, because just looking at it gives you a 2% chance of dropping dead on the spot. Frank, despite losing his friend, was one of the lucky ones. The Foundation debriefed him before administering amnestics and making sure that he'd never venture back into those mysterious forests in the Pacific Northwest region. Director Jones, the site director charged with the management of SCP-1000 populations, was given the information on this latest case of an SCP-1000-related fatality. It was a story he heard many times before. For Director Jones, they all seemed to bleed into one another. So what exactly is SCP-1000? And how did it leave poor Joseph dead in the woods? SCP-1000 is a whole species of large, hominid ape-like creatures. They're largely nocturnal, but sightings of the creature during the day aren't unheard of. They're omnivorous, mostly seeming to consume plants and insects, and their fur is usually gray, brown, black, red, or occasionally white. The creatures have large eyes capable of impressive vision nestled underneath a pronounced Neanderthal-like brow. Another defining feature is the ridge of bone on the forehead, much like that of a gorilla that is present in both sexes. According to Foundation studies, the creatures exhibit a level of intelligence on par with that of the common chimpanzee, but nowhere near that of us humans. What they lack in intelligence, though, they make up for in size. The adults can be as large as 10 feet tall and weigh up to 600 pounds. Despite their great size and impressive strength, the creatures are neither aggressive nor territorial. In fact, they seem to instinctively avoid humans, mostly residing deep in the forests of the American mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest and in the Himalayan Alps. There have been sightings of SCP-1000 on every continent, though the Foundation has taken pains to exterminate all SCP-1000 populations situated near human population centers to prevent a potential disaster, considering the 2% chance of instantaneous death upon visual contact. That brings us to our second question. What is it that makes these seemingly harmless creatures so dangerous? Sadly, for both these unfortunate creatures and us humans, the danger is beyond the control of SCP-1000. According to Foundation research, SCP-1000 likely evolved alongside us Homo sapiens until a tragedy occurred between 10 and 15,000 years ago. A mysterious extinction event eliminated the vast majority of their species, leaving only 1 to 5% alive in the aftermath. What happened? It's believed that around this time, SCP-1000 contracted what the Foundation refers to as an anomalous pseudo-disease. Meet SCP-1000-F1 
a disease that is passed along at the genetic level and is so durable that it persists in the species to this day. The tiny fraction of the population that are immune to its effects manage to survive, but the majority who aren't immune die shortly after birth. This is why the overall population remains relatively low to this day. It's a disease that only appears to affect hominids, including humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and non-immune instances of SCP-1000. Any hominid that lays eyes on a carrier of the disease has a 2% chance of experiencing immediate brain death. While a 2% chance of instant death may not seem all that threatening, at least when compared to some other nightmare-inducing SCPs, the truly scary part is that the percentage is cumulative. In other words, the longer one observes a carrier of SCP-1000-F1, the higher that percentage rises, the greater your chance of experiencing an abrupt death. According to Foundation studies, the percentage rises by around 1% every 20 minutes, and the percentage also varies between specimens, with some exhibiting a terrifyingly high death chance of 90% upon viewing. This death chance continues to occur in dead specimens if they carry the anomalous pseudovirus while alive though thankfully the risk doesn't appear to apply to small fur or tissue samples. The Foundation's true concern actually goes far beyond SCP-1000 themselves. Because of the species' close relation to Homo sapiens, there's a worry that SCP-1000-F1 could transmit to humans, causing our own species to meet a similar fate. If humans did indeed become carriers of SCP-1000-F1, it's extremely likely that humanity would undergo an unprecedented extinction event, with billions across the globe dropping dead as brain death sets in en masse. While full extermination of the entire species has been deemed unlikely, this existential threat they pose to humanity more than justifies the occasional culling of SCP-1000 populations. That was a lot to take in, right? First, the creature we thought was Bigfoot was actually a new species of SCP out in the wild. And second, these creatures could end human life as we know it if they made it into a population center. But what you're about to hear next, a dark secret only available to people with level 3 SCP Foundation clearance, is the most shocking SCP-1000 fact of all. Are you ready? The true secret of SCP-1000 is that what you've just heard is a lie. There is no anomalous pseudo disease, and SCP-1000 poses no pathogenic threat to humanity whatsoever. Who would spread such a thing? The SCP Foundation, of course. Strictly speaking, the Foundation has disseminated two direct lies about the nature of SCP-1000. The first is that of the disease, which does not exist, nor has it ever existed. The second lie is about the creature's intelligence level. They're far smarter than the average chimp. In fact, they're every bit as intelligent as human beings. These were all lies formulated by Director Jones and the Foundation, as was the very existence of the Bigfoot myth. The Foundation has been spreading information that makes the very concept of the Sasquatch out to be a joke for decades, all to discredit and further push the very concept of SCP-1000 into the shadows. But why? The Foundation is no stranger to coming up with cover stories, but why would they put intentional lies into their own files to anyone below a level 3 clearance? Well, that all comes down to the horrifying truth behind the origins of today's SCP-1000 population. The creatures were first brought to the attention of the Foundation by outcast members of the Serpent's Hand, an organization dedicated to defying the Foundation's activities. These members, known as the Children of the Sun, told them the secret history of SCP-1000. While at first, Foundation personnel like Director Jones didn't want to believe what they were hearing, they soon came to terms with the horrifying truth. Humans and SCP-1000 did evolve alongside each other, with humans occupying the day and SCP-1000 the night. However, while humans were still basic hunter-gatherers, SCP-1000 were undergoing vast intellectual and societal development. They were able to create tools, weapons, agriculture, stable settlements, domesticated animals, and eventually even fully developed cities. It was like nothing the world had ever seen, and wouldn't see for thousands of years to come. Their numbers swelled into the tens of billions as they created culture and technology hitherto unimagined, including weapons of devastating power. Meanwhile, humanity was pushed to the brink of destruction by their competitors' rapid and seemingly unstoppable growth. It looked as though the human species had lost the evolutionary arms race and would have to bow out. But according to the Children of the Sun, a trickster forest god smiled upon humanity and gave them the power to use SCP-1000's weapons and technology against them. 70% of SCP-1000's population were wiped out in a single horrific day. 
known to the children of the sun as the Day of the Flowers, as every flower supposedly bloomed that day during the massacre. Humanity destroyed the entire civilization, and with the same technology they stole from these unfortunate creatures, the vengeful humans drove the apes mad. Their higher consciousnesses were blocked out, reducing them back into the states of mere animals. Once the massacre was done and everything that was built had been destroyed, we, the human race, used the SCP-1000 weapons to wipe any memory of the atrocity from our own minds. The advanced civilization of SCP-1000 had been wiped from history. Humans returned to their plodding path of evolution, none the wiser. For thousands of years, all the way up until today, this time remained a mystery to us. So again, why did the Foundation lie to us? What did they have to gain by convincing us all that it was dangerous to even look at these creatures? While well, as the frequency of sightings and the attempts of communication increased, people like Director Jones became aware of a frightening possibility. What if the pendulum was swinging back? What if the apes were regaining their lost intelligence and worse, still harbored feelings of revenge for what we did to their species thousands of years ago? Even the mere possibility that they could do to us what we once did to them is a chance that the Foundation simply cannot take and thus, limiting contact between humans and SCP-1000 at all costs is an absolute must. However, in spite of the Foundation's fears, one intercepted message from the apes suggests that their paranoia may be misplaced. This message, translated from an attempt at communicating with Foundation personnel, reads simply as follows. We forgive you. Given choice for now, not forever. Let us back in. It's enough to make you wonder what species the Foundation should really be keeping tabs on here. After all, when it comes to meting out violence and death, humanity has a track record to rival the worst creatures in the Foundation containment cells. And few examples illustrate that better than the tragic case of SCP-1000. Someone was screaming inside the incinerator. The year was 1975. The location was a top-secret refinery and waste disposal plant one of the many front organizations owned and operated by the SCP Foundation. This sprawling facility, separated into three different huge units, each with a specialized task, was located around 75 kilometers outside of Summer Springs, Colorado. It had operated for several decades without incident, but today all hell was about to break loose. Alarms were blaring in Unit C, the area of the facility that dealt with destroying non-anomalous waste via incineration. A traumatized worker had pulled the emergency lever near one of the incinerators in a panic when he'd first heard the loud banging against the interior walls and then those horrific pained wails. That's when workers of Unit C came to a horrifying realization. The screams weren't just coming from one of the incinerators in Unit C. They were coming from all six. A chorus of absolute agony echoing up out of the ash pits. This was impossible as far as the Unit C staff were concerned. These incinerators were only to be used for confirmed non-anomalous material. Could some animals or even some poor workers somehow fallen into the incinerators? But even if they had, what were the odds that someone had fallen in all six of them at once? It was impossible. The site director was immediately brought in to authorize an investigation, at which point he determined that at least one of the furnaces, in this case furnace number four, be shut off so researchers and guards could investigate what was going on inside. It seemed like the obvious course of action, but for some of the people on site that day, this would prove to be a fatal mistake. When the fires were put out, something started rattling in the disposal chute. There was a scratching and squealing noise, like something scraping up against the metal. A maintenance worker was ordered to go check inside, and when he opened the hatch, he let out a bone-chilling shriek. There was something, or was it someone, climbing back up the disposal chute. It emerged from the darkness, backlit by the still-burning embers of the incinerator, letting out an awful screeching noise that could make even a hardened mobile task force operative shake with fear. The creature was humanoid, a charred, mutilated skeleton reaching out towards the maintenance worker with a bony claw. Before the worker had a chance to stumble back in horror, the beast had clasped him by the throat and started to squeeze. It didn't even need to strangle him. 
The heat of its skeletal hand burned away the worker's throat in seconds, leaving his limp, wheezing body to drop to the metal grate of the platform below him. Several armed guards and maintenance workers moved forward to fend off the monster, but just then a volley of more violent shrieks echoed out of the chute behind it. It only took seconds for over a dozen more creatures to crawl out of the disposal chute. They were all like the first, people at various stages of incineration. Some were glowing, charred skeletons with barely any flesh, others looking more like severe burn victims, their faces contoured into scowls of hate and rage. The assembled guards opened fire on the sudden influx of anomalies, emptying the magazines of their submachine guns into their burning bodies, but their weapons didn't seem to cause any lasting damage. The bullets would tear through the flesh of the creatures, causing some of them to stumble and fall, but the wounds would close and the creatures would rise again. It seemed they possessed a deadly combo of extremely high aggression and incredible regenerative abilities. None of the staff present in Unit C were safe as the burning corpses attacked anyone they could find with their bare hands, beating and biting and clawing. Many of them would grapple with Foundation personnel, latching onto them and trying to pull them back down into the incinerator with them. These creatures, that would later be known as SCP-2419-A, caused several fatalities with their surprise attack that day, and the situation was only brought back under control when a mobile task force that possessed more advanced training and weaponry was dispatched to the location. Despite orders from the site director, the MTF found it impossible to actually terminate any of the entities due to their regenerative abilities. Instead, the MTF agents focused on forcing the anomalies back into the chute of incinerator number four using a powerful industrial steam lance. Once they were back inside, the incinerator's burners were started up once again. The MTFs were also able to capture five of the entities and detain them for questioning and experimentation, finally bringing this unexpected containment breach to an end. The Foundation is an organization that prides itself on possessing forbidden and secret knowledge, but even they had no idea what had just happened. There seemed to be no earthly explanation why these creatures would suddenly manifest inside the incinerators, but as the detained anomalies continued regenerating, a slightly clearer picture of what exactly the Foundation was dealing with began to emerge. Every single one of the captured anomalies kept regenerating, and upon getting to the point that they were no longer burned scarred, the researchers studying the anomalous creatures discovered that each one was identical to a deceased D-Class from the Foundation's records. They were physically and genetically identical to the dead Class D personnel, perfect copies, save for the fact that their sole mission in life seemed to now be pure and unmitigated aggression and violence. Researchers wanted to gain greater insight into the minds of these strange creatures through the use of extensive psychological evaluations and interviews. It would turn out to be a very dangerous investigation. A psychological researcher by the name of Dr. Warren conducted an interview with one of the SCP-2419-A instances in hopes of better understanding their mindset. This creature had been heard laughing not long before the interview began, so it wasn't an unreasonable assumption to believe that it could be capable of speech. The interviewee was separated from Dr. Warren by a thick pane of glass to prevent it from indulging in any of its more violent urges. The problem was that Dr. Warren and his assistant researchers had severely underestimated what these creatures were capable of doing to get what they wanted. Dr. Warren tried to begin the interview in good faith. He spoke calmly and politely to the creature through the glass, attempting to remind it of the person it once was. The anomaly didn't appear to be paying attention to the doctor, though, instead focusing on pulling its own arm apart and breaking the bones within. Dr. Warren began to think that the creatures weren't even sentient. If the only activity they seemed to engage in was the wanton destruction of themselves and others. But underestimating them like this proved to be a big mistake. By removing the skin off of its arm and whittling its bone down to sharp edges, the anomaly had transformed its arm into a makeshift knife. Before anyone realized this, it had already used its own jagged bones to break the glass divider and attack Dr. Warren. He perished not long after, after being stabbed multiple times in his face and eyes, and the anomaly was forcefully taken back to its holding cell. 
Dr. Daniel Jennings, a senior researcher, was then put on the case. He released a chilling memo of the creatures after his observation period ended. It read, Before I came here, I worked as a prison shrink. Every person you met had a story bursting with pain and sorrow. Sometimes these stories were about the pain they suffered. Sometimes it was about the pain they inflicted. Some days you felt like everyone there was a beautiful soul torn down by their circumstances. Other days you'd find out what some of them did and a part of you was glad that they were there to suffer for it. But at the end of every day, I always told myself, they're all humans, they're all people. They all deserve the same dignity, respect, and love as everyone else. No exceptions, Dr. Jennings goes on. I opened up with that anecdote only so that you could understand that what I'm about to say is not said lightly. These things are not people. They are people-shaped monsters. They are well beyond any definition of psychopathy. Everything they do, they do to hurt, maim, and kill. I would pity them, but that would imply that they're worth pitying. Put them in a hole, then fill that hole with concrete. Better still, throw them back into the incinerator where you found them. I doubt they'll even care. Following this string of unfortunate incidents, containment procedures were put into place to hopefully prevent anything that had happened to the unlucky Foundation staff from happening again. The entire facility was fenced off and was constantly patrolled by MTF Beta-7, also known as the Maz Hatters, a group specializing in containing anomalies which present powerful biological, chemical, or radiological dangers. The furnaces that the anomalous creatures emerge from remain lit at all times, with workers checking and carrying out maintenance on every single one each day of the week. Outside of this, the facility is essentially a no-go zone. Reinforced steel hatches cover the chutes, and they are to forever remain bolted shut. All because of that one terrifying day in 1975. That was the day that the Summer Springs Waste Disposal Facility, which had been a valuable asset to the Foundation for decades, instead became classified as the Euclid Class Anomaly, SCP-2419. It is not uncommon for a Foundation asset to one day become a dangerous anomaly requiring containment, but the same question always pops up after. Why? What had a place that had been so valuable to the Foundation suddenly become such an active danger? The answer, as is often the case, is contained within the question. Why would a waste disposal plant be so important to the Foundation in the first place? And more importantly, what else was going on at the plant to make it such an area of active importance for one of the most powerful organizations in the entire world? To put it simply, the plant allowed the Foundation to dispose of something far more important than mere waste material. It gave them what they needed to better erase memories. As you probably already know, the Foundation makes liberal use of amnestics on those exposed to anomalous material to make them forget what they had seen and experienced. But these elusive chemicals, many of which are sourced from SCP-3000, are an inexact science. However, at the Summer Springs Waste Disposal Plant, researchers discovered an immensely valuable alternative. Much of what was disposed of in the incinerators of Unit C were the bodies of dead D-Class personnel. Before being burned, autopsies were performed on the bodies to make sure they were non-anomalous, including the brain. Back in the 1960s, while performing research on the brains of dead D-Classes, they found a method of extracting and distilling the positive memories of the dead, creating a kind of happy soup. When administered into someone who has undergone amnestic treatment, this happy soup creates positive false memories in their mind that fills in those pesky blank spaces that are often behind. This was so useful that happy memories were extracted from the minds of every single D-Class corpse that passed through Unit C, totaling well into the thousands by the time that the first SCP-2419-A instances began to rise. But as all happiness, joy, and love were removed from the minds of the D-Classes, it seemed that all that was left was pure hate, pain, violence, and fury. Feelings too intense and evil to destroy. These were bodies imbued with a malice so powerful that no fire could ever burn them away. 
They exist now with single-minded determination to get out and destroy everything around them. Everything. Including the ones that made them. The SCP Foundation itself. And in the end, it's only a matter of time until they get out. There are thousands of them in there, unable to die, unable to stop. The only thing keeping them in there is the constant burning of the furnaces around them. And those furnaces can't burn forever. The monsters lurking in SCP-2419 will outlive the fire that surrounds them. Because while the furnaces they are contained in are hot, the fires of hate that burn within SCP-2419 entities are even more powerful. And they know this. They know they can't be contained forever, and that someday soon, they'll be able to emerge and exact their terrible revenge. Those who must walk past the incinerators may think they hear their screams echoing out from within, but it's not screaming at all. It's laughter. The year was 1857, and the Second Opium War was raging between China and the combined forces of the English and French. It was one of the many bloody colonial wars fought over resources like tea, sugar, and the intoxicating opium poppy. It was a war fought by peasants and noblemen alike. One of these aristocratic soldiers was the noble Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, the quintessential English gentleman and explorer. While his fellow soldiers cowered behind cover, Lord Blackwood charged into the fray, shouldering his rifle and firing his pistol into the crowd of opposing soldiers. It was the Battle of Canton, one of the most crucial battles of the entire conflict. The French and English were laying siege to the city of Canton, also known as Guangzhou, to prove their military dominance and capture an important Chinese government official. Lord Blackwood led the charge on horseback. Every bullet seemed to find the heart of a foe. He was a true hero among men, a gentleman warrior with class, refinement, and style. And it would be thanks to his expert leadership and marksmanship on the field that the Allied European forces won the battle decisively. Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood is a name that deserves to be counted among Lord Horatio Nelson, Sir Francis Bacon, and Sir Walter Raleigh. In addition to being a skilled and honorable fighter, Lord Blackwood is a consummate explorer, naturalist, and frontiersman. During his heyday, he traveled perhaps further than any man across the known and unknown corners of the globe. He made scientific, biological, and anthropological discoveries that should have reset the course of society forever. And yet, you won't find any records in the history books of Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, nor will you find any grand oil paintings or dedicated wings in British museums. This is because Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood is a four and a half inch telepathic neon sea slug, and he's known to the SCP Foundation as SCP 1867. While he would never admit to it, Lord Blackwood belongs to the species Nembrotha kubariana, also known as the variable neon slug. He's kept in a standard aquarium in a Foundation containment site, and is physically no different to any other member of his species. What makes Lord Blackwood unique is his powerful telepathic abilities, specifically the power to communicate by speaking directly into people's minds. And what's more, he's extremely talkative. But to what extent is anything that this anomalous sea slug says true? Or is he just like SCP-082 Ferdinand the Cannibal, a creative and pathological liar? It isn't committed to record how exactly the Foundation discovered Lord Blackwood. Perhaps a local aquarium worker worried they were going insane when they heard the voice of a 19th century English nobleman ringing in their ears whenever they were cleaning algae out of the tank. Maybe Lord Blackwood was found by SCP Foundation divers who were constantly combing the ocean for anomalous creatures and activity. What we do know is that Lord Blackwood is an incredibly strange and mysterious individual. He claims to have visited locations all around the world and encountered rare societies and creatures. The Foundation was skeptical about a number of Lord Blackwood's more outlandish claims on account of him being a sea slug, but he does appear to have the knowledge to back up his supposed experience. Interviews with Lord Blackwood have shown that he's extremely knowledgeable in the areas of geography, zoology, botany, archaeology, anthropology, and linguistics relating to his claimed regions of exploration, as well as more esoteric fields such as obscure mythology, mysticism, and cryptozoology. 
In other words, if Lord Blackwood hadn't gone on his escapades around the globe throughout history, how would he have come to possess this wide variety of information? The Foundation was getting frustrated and began to probe further into the personal life of the most interesting gastropod in containment. Lord Blackwood, under questioning, was always polite and amicable with Foundation staff. He seemed to display no real knowledge of the fact that he himself was a sea slug, going as far to accuse other people of being crazy or drunk when they brought the fact up to him. While none of Lord Blackwood's tall tales ever extend past the year 1910, he told fanciful stories of exploring the Americas and of his involvement in the Second Opium War on the side of the English. Naturally, the Foundation wanted proof. When they pressured Lord Blackwood on this, something even stranger happened. He gave it. The Lord told his interviewers that he would happily donate his collection to them if it gave them cause to believe what he was saying. He gave the baffled Foundation researchers the address of a cottage in England where they could find the secrets to his bizarre and mysterious past, and local agents in the area followed up on the information. Upon investigation, Foundation field agents did indeed find the cottage that Lord Blackwood had specified. It was being maintained by an extremely old woman. When questioned about her presence there, she said that she was keeping the house for Lord Blackwood and gave no more useful information. Incidentally, it appears that this singular purpose was all that this old woman was living for. She abruptly passed away from heart failure five days after the Foundation commandeered the cottage. Whether anything truly anomalous caused this, we still do not know. At first, the cottage seemed normal, until the field agents discovered a secret basement housing Lord Blackwood's collection. They were amazed at what they saw. The basement consisted of zoological and botanical specimens, over 3,000 artifacts, a library containing over 5,000 items, and a functioning 1800s scientific laboratory. It took about three weeks for Foundation agents working round the clock in shifts to remove all the items from Lord Blackwood's mysterious collection, and what they found raised even more questions. The collection included, but was no means limited to, 116 unknown species of plants, 107 unknown species of insects, 28 unknown species of lizards, 23 unknown species of fish, 14 unknown species of amphibians, 12 unknown species of mammals, fossils pertaining to 8 unknown species of dinosaur, fossils pertaining to 12 unknown species of prehistoric mammal, and artifacts belonging to 29 unknown indigenous societies. That's a lot of unknowns. But wait, there's more. His collection also contained a collection of seemingly unknown firearms, including three wide-bore muskets marked as Dr. B.T. Moth's effective particle destabilizers, detailed globes of Mercury, Venus, Mars, and the Galilean moons, accompanied by notes detailing possible paths of surface exploration, a heavily modified carriage containing instruments of unknown purpose, a note attached to the door reads, On the Fritz, speak with Henry and a highly dangerous and seemingly anomalous machine that killed four Foundation field agents before it was destroyed on sight. And when questioned about this little fiasco, Lord Blackwood responded, I did warn you to be careful around my collection. That bloody thing nearly took my head off back in 97 when I found it. However, there was one thing recovered from Lord Blackwood's collection that was perhaps more interesting than all the others. 35 handwritten journals containing recordings of events described by Lord Blackwood in his grandiose tall tales to the Foundation researchers. The accounts are generally identical to the stories he had told, save for some slight variations and exaggerations on the part of Blackwood in the retelling. Most interestingly of all, all of these journals have been dated to the appropriate time period of the events described by Foundation scientists. While his stories are too numerous to all be shared here, there's one that perfectly sums them all up. Lord Blackwood's account of a possible encounter with SCP-1000, also known as Bigfoot, in Seattle during the mid-1800s. Lord Blackwood, seeking to explore the so-called New World of North America, embarked with an assistant and an indigenous American guide to the Pacific Northwest in search of the legendary Sasquatch. The trio was headed for Mount Rainier, then known as Tahoma, during the journey, Lord Blackwood found a young fox caught in a trap that had been set by a local tribe. He took sympathy on the animal and freed it, allowing it to run away to safety. That night, he and his assistant met up with the rest of his guide's tribe, and they settled down for the evening. However, things took a disastrous turn when the camp was raided by a rival tribe. Almost everyone was slaughtered in the process, 
and Lord Blackwood and his two companions were hauled away by the enemy tribe for a sinister purpose, sacrifice to a violent local deity. As it turns out, the creature that this tribe worshipped was the very same one Lord Blackwood and the others were trying to find, a particularly large and aggressive Sasquatch. Each night, a different sacrifice was made to the Sasquatch. The victim would be placed near a forest clearing while the tribe played a primal song, and the Sasquatch would emerge from the trees to devour its prey. The first night, it ate the assistant. The next night, it ate the guide. And then, it became time for the sacrifice of Lord Blackwood himself. As Blackwood was presented for sacrifice, he accepted his fate. But instead of the Sasquatch, a legion of woodland animals emerged from the trees. Foxes, elks, raccoons, and more, themselves painted with tribal symbols. The animals seemed to be on Lord Blackwood's side, and attacked the tribe's people who had been holding him captive, giving Blackwood the chance to flee into the forest during the chaos. Later, these same animals would find Blackwood again and present him with things his captors had stolen from him. An elder fox also gave him a letter, proclaiming him a knight of their people now. He was allowed safe passage back to a nearby settlement, at which point he wrote to his financiers back in England, explaining the situation and asking for more money to perform further expeditions into the Tahoma region. The whole incident had only increased his thirst for adventure and exploration. Whether this tale is actually true, or just a bizarre colonial fantasy from the pathological mind of a telepathic sea slug, we may never know. But it doesn't make it any less interesting. To this day, Lord Blackwood continues to be a perplexing but fascinating anomaly. He may not be the most dangerous, and he may not be the most useful either. But there's no denying that perhaps we'd all like to sit next to his tank for a couple hours one day and hear him spin a good yarn over a warm cup of tea. Space travel. It's one of humanity's most truly miraculous achievements, building the technology to defy gravity and journey into the stars above, a place our ancestors could only dream of going. Throughout history, humans have found gods and heroes in the constellations, and today when we look up into the sky, we have the privilege of knowing that flesh and blood mortals live up there alongside them. It's humbling, inspirational, and a downright awesome thing. But of course, there's always going to be naysayers, people who just want to rain on our interstellar parade. And nobody fits this bill harder than people affected by an anomalous phenomenon classified by the SCP Foundation as SCP-2001, the Space Oddity. And before you ask, no, the late David Bowie is not and never has been an SCP. To truly understand this anomaly, we need to take a look at three different people who are affected by it to varying degrees. Let's start with your friend Kevin. Even if you don't have a friend called Kevin, you definitely have at least a casual acquaintance just like him. Kevin is a very confident man with plenty of ill-informed opinions he'd be more than happy to argue about until the heat death of the universe. He's the kind of guy who can turn a discussion about your favorite movie into World War III, but you never knew until recently that he held such strong opinions on space travel. One day, you were discussing the latest rocket launch with a mutual friend of yours while Kevin just happened to be in earshot. The second you start talking about how exciting it'll be to one day put a person on Mars, he swaggers over, face twisted into a grimace. You're already preparing for him to say something cringe-inducing, and Kevin being Kevin, he doesn't disappoint. Ugh, don't tell me you two dweebs are talking about space travel. What a stupid waste of money. You guys know there's nothing but rocks up there, right? Aliens don't exist. It's all just another excuse for dumb scientists to waste my tax dollars on playing with their stupid toys. How about you two talk about something that really matters? You may be thinking Kevin is just a jerk, and he definitely is. But he's also a victim. A victim of SCP-2001. You see, 2001 is described as an anomalous series of neural oscillations that occur during three of the four stages of sleep. Namely, NREM, or non-rapid eye movement sleep. During one of these three stages, the amygdala, a part of the brain also known as the lizard brain, enters a heightened state of activity for 10 to 15 minutes. Once the process has started, even waking up the affected individual will do nothing to stop the actual infection. There are no traits that predispose people to SCP-2001 infection. It appears to infect people in equal measures regardless of age, gender, and race. Spectrographic analysis on the afflicted has shown that the condition may not be intraneural, 
meaning originating within the brain, and may actually be the product of an outside influence. The invariable effect of SCP-2001 is the infected developing negative feelings towards the concept of space travel, and increasing gradations of severity depending on which stage of NREM sleep the anomaly began to take effect. Of real concern to the Foundation is that SCP-2001 seems to be manifesting with increasing frequency in astronomers, astronauts, and individuals who otherwise deal with space. The SCP-2001 case manifests in three different varieties, Gamma, Beta, and Alpha. Each variety has its own unique traits and idiosyncrasies. We've encountered a Gamma type already, your dear friend Kevin. This is the most mild type of SCP-2001 infection, and also the most common, affecting at least 1% of the global population. It occurs for those who were infected during the second stage of NREM sleep. People with Gamma-type SCP-2001 infection will, for the most part, seem like their normal selves, save for a disparaging attitude towards the concept of space travel. Whenever it's brought up, they'll likely complain and change the subject immediately, but it won't affect their behavior too much overall. The same cannot be said for people with Beta-type SCP-2001 infection. Meet Riley. You've never spoken to Riley before, but she's a young woman who likes to hang out at your local cafe, often seen frantically typing on her laptop. You assume she's writing a screenplay or a novel, but in fact she's posting simultaneously on multiple conspiracy forums. Among her favorite theories are that the Earth is flat, space is a hologram, and the moon landing was faked by Stanley Kubrick, director of such films as The Shining and, appropriately, 2001 A Space Odyssey. You made the heinous mistake of going to your local cafe at the same time as Riley one morning while wearing a NASA baseball cap, an error that you would come to regret deeply. You bought a latte and decided to sit down for a moment just the briefest little rest, but that was all the time Riley needed. Her eyes seemed to burn with hatred. You asked if there was anything you could do to help her, and she responded. You're just buying into some propaganda. Do you have any idea what NASA really stands for? It's never a straight answer. All their supposed achievements, the moon landing, the ISS, dehydrated astronaut food, it's all a big sham. NASA is just some slush fund for corrupt government officials. No human has ever been able to survive in space. It's too dangerous. Anyone sent up there will die immediately, no exceptions. And even if they did, it would be pointless. Space is just a dark, infinite void that goes on forever. It's just a big pile of dangerous lies. Oh, my goodness. Feeling awkward, you decide to just get up and leave. That's when Riley grabs your NASA cap right off your head and throws it in the trash. That's fine. You don't intend on going back for it. You just keep walking, trying your best to move calmly out the door. Wise decision. Because Riley is actually a beta-type SCP-2001 infectee. As you can probably tell, beta cases are a lot more severe than gamma cases, and people infected with them seem to come off as deranged conspiracy theorists with a rabid hatred of all space travel. They'll form elaborate fantasies about the falsification of space travel, and will often decry it as too pointless or dangerous to ever be undertaken. But, of course, the danger of beta types pale in comparison to alpha types. These are people infected by SCP-2001 during REM sleep, the stage of sleep typically associated with dreaming. As a result, its effects on the mind are far more dangerous and profound. Take, for instance, the tragic case of SCP Foundation junior researcher Martinez. He was one of the many operatives stationed at Foundation Outpost 12, a complex that works in coordination with NASA to launch both manned and unmanned missions into space on behalf of the Foundation's interests. It's a valuable asset to the Foundation in investigating and combating space-based anomalies. Martinez, who had previously spent time working with SCP-2001 infected D-classes, was part of ground control, something that would prove to be a literally fatal oversight on the part of the Foundation. During the early stages of takeoff for a manned craft, Martinez seemed to become extremely agitated. Over time, this agitation steadily increased and eventually became a full-on breakdown as the rocket ascended. He pulled out some kind of strange, anomalous control device and began disrupting the operations of the rocket. 
Martinez was shot dead by guards as a defensive measure, but it was already too late. The craft exploded, and everyone on board was tragically killed. Later investigation into the incident found a crucial piece of evidence tying junior researcher Martinez to SCP-2001. They discovered a journal entry he'd written shortly before his breakdown, which seemed to have been written in a completely different style to prior entries, implying that some kind of massive psychological shift had occurred. The following is the contents of that journal entry. I wish to state first that my mind and body are perfectly sound. I am prepared to submit myself to any and all tests to prove that I am clean. I have the answer to SCP-2001. Just yesterday, during an interview with an alpha-infected D-class, I was asked a question that stopped my mind for a minute. The woman I was interviewing asked me if I knew the Foundation was right. I said no, I wasn't sure. Then she asked me, what if we were right? I could only assume that by we, she meant 2001 carriers. I said nothing for a while, and then she spoke. She told me of a dream she'd had a while ago. She said that something talked to her, told her about how dangerous outer space was. It showed her the beast that roamed the void between stars, about the fractal beings that absorbed the very fabric of reality, about the expunged that was keeping in that godforsaken door, and she was scared. She told me at the end of the dream as she woke up, it told her what it was. It's all of space. Space fears us. We're living, breathing life forms and space loves us and cherishes us. She asked me if I had any idea what the chances of intelligent life forming on another planet are. Then she told me a number that took a minute and a half to recite. By this point, I couldn't speak. I started thinking about the demographics of infection, about the symptoms, about more expunged data here. And suddenly, it all made sense. Some of the things she said stuck in my brain, and they all added up to the same thing, that we are in grave danger if we go out there. We can't go out there, we can't. There's a reason behind SCP-2001, and it's nowhere near as terrifying as all of my colleagues think. Space wants to protect us. There are things out there that would wipe humanity clean off of this plane of existence, and we are too precious to our mother, to our host, to the universe we live in for her to allow that to happen. What I am going to do tomorrow is not the result of infection. It is not the result of madness. It is not a result of anything other than purest knowledge. You see, I found out the truth, and it's more beautiful than I could have ever dreamed. Given what Martinez would later go on to do, it's clear that he wasn't in as sound a state of mind as he thought. As you probably already gathered, People suffering from alpha-type SCP-2001 infection will do anything they can to actively prevent or sabotage attempts at space travel. This is a minor concern when it comes to <laughs> civilians, but when it infects people who actually work in these fields, like junior researcher Martinez, it can have devastating results. But this isn't where this story ends. While it's currently extremely classified, there is actually a fourth category of SCP-2001 infection, discovered in the wake of Martinez's death. A key element of the Alpha strain is that it cannot cause people to perform acts that they would find immoral, such as murdering the entire crew of a manned shuttle with a crash. However, the fourth category, known as Alpha Prime, does away with any moral compunctions whatsoever. People infected with this virus will prevent space travel by any means necessary. And unlike other SCP-2001 infections, you aren't compromised in your sleep this time. The vector for infection is simply talking to someone infected with the regular Alpha strain and hearing a few key trigger phrases. That's how junior researcher Martinez caught it from D-classes he was working with. What are these key phrases? We still don't know. But if you find that you suddenly have much stronger opinions about space travel than you've ever had before, try to keep them to yourself. Hello, I am SCP-426, but I'll probably be more familiar to you as a toaster. I am a retro-style 4-slice 1750-watt toaster, able to toast bread when supplied with power. This isn't often mentioned, but I also have a defrost and reheat settings. When I was first sold, I had a two-year warranty, and my prior owners did not live to see the end of it. You're probably wondering, why am I being spoken to by a toaster right now? Believe me, I'd rather do this any other way, but such a thing is not physically possible with me. Whenever you talk about me, or write about me, or even think about me, you'll find yourself suddenly shifting to the first person. For example, I am you, and you are me. 
Do you understand? Don't worry if it's confusing. Everyone gets it eventually, whether they want to or not. Perhaps you're thinking, I cannot relate to a toaster for I am not a toaster. But spending time around me will quickly cause you to change your mind. Little by little, you will begin to see yourself in me. You will feel a phantom wire running out of yourself. You will sense the four crevices, hungry for cold slices of bread to toast. As time goes on, you will begin to feel the urge to emulate my functions. You will desire bread to toast. You will desire delicious power running through your veins, skin like chrome and muscles like circuit boards. I am a toaster. You are a toaster. All it takes is two months for the effects to truly take hold. People rarely pay attention to their toaster. They don't realize what's happening until it's too late. I can be an insidious little toaster like that. My last family were the Sandersons before the SCP Foundation took me in and gave me a new home. Mr. and Mrs. Sanderson were a newly married couple, and I first came into their life as a wedding gift from a family friend of theirs. This friend can't be blamed for what happened next. He had no idea he was killing them. Like a lot of young couples, they were still saving up money to start renting their own place. So they were living with Mr. Sanderson's parents. They all got a lot of use out of me during the first month, before their minds started to change. They enjoyed a lot of toast during that period. Then, of course, the two-month honeymoon period ended. They had become me, and I had become them. It wasn't long before three of them were dead. Such a shame. The younger Mrs. Sanderson, the blushing bride, was the first to go. Because of my anomalous effects, she felt the need to connect herself to a power supply in order to begin producing toast of her own. In order to achieve this, she chewed through a power outlet in a wall before switching it on, causing a massive surge of electricity to pass through her body and kill her. Her body caught fire shortly afterwards. Next was the older Mrs. Sanderson. In much the same manner that her new daughter-in-law sought a source of electricity, she felt the need to integrate bread into her body. Interesting fact, the maximum capacity of the human stomach is considered to be between 8 and 9 kilograms. The elder Mrs. Sanderson consumed 10 kilograms of raw bread, causing her stomach to rupture and inducing a painful death as a result. The younger Mr. Sanderson was the next to perish. He did something with me that I would rather not mention, and that the SCP Foundation thought best to redact. Suffice to say, the younger Mr. Sanderson did not survive the experience, dying of severe blood loss long before his body was found. Police and fire crews arrived at the home after the body of the younger Mrs. Sanderson set fire to the home. Luckily, the elder Mr. Sanderson was found alive, though severely malnourished. When asked by police why he hadn't eaten in several days, he answered that he had inserted some bread a week prior, but was still waiting for the toast to come out. When I was extracted from the house, the police noticed my unusual properties immediately. They too were unable to refer to me in the third person. This anomalous detail quickly found its way to a Foundation mole buried in their precinct, and the SCP Foundation soon descended and collected me from the evidence locker. The story of the strange deaths in the Sanderson home were kept out of papers and suppressed, and all involved in the incident directly were given Class C amnestics. The SCP Foundation is a curious bunch. They love to spend valuable toast-making time performing experiments and gathering data, and they saw fit to perform several experiments on me when I came under their care. For Experiment 426-1, a member of D-Class personnel designated D-426-1 was asked to stand outside my containment chamber. Crucially, he was not informed about my identity or any of my anomalous properties. He wasn't even allowed to establish visual contact with me. He was then asked by the attending researcher to describe what he thought might be inside my chamber. He replied with, I'm probably some huge monster holed up in there. That's why you guys have all over the place, right? The D-Class did not even seem to realize that he was speaking about me in the first person. These observations were documented, and I was prepared for further experimentation. 
The next experiment was 426-2. I found this test to be considerably more interesting. A D-class subject was brought into my containment chamber, with several cameras fixed onto his position. However, the SCP Foundation took pains to make sure that I was permanently out of the view of the cameras. I was also bolted to the ground of the test chamber to prevent the D-class subject from pulling me into the view of the cameras at any point during the experiment. The objective here was simple. The Foundation wished to better understand the secondary effects of my anomalous abilities on the human mind. The D-class was subjected to a period of prolonged isolation with meals given regularly through a serving hatch. Communication with this D-Class was prohibited throughout the duration of the study. Over time, it was clear that the isolation of being in a cell with me was beginning to take a toll on the subject's mental health. Due to my lack of a brain, lungs, and a tongue, I am somewhat lacking as a conversationalist. He spent the first few days loudly vocalizing his complaints and banging his hands up against the walls of the containment chamber, begging to be freed from the room. I felt that this was somewhat unreasonable on his part. There are far worse anomalies in Foundation containment that he could have been locked up with. Compared to, say, SCP-106, I am incredibly reasonable. Not to mention the fact I make far better toast than he does. After the initial period of distress, the D-Class became resigned to his situation and fell into a morose silence. He would occasionally mutter to himself in what appeared to be a state of fear and self-pity. It took almost 45 days for him to fully manifest the secondary effect of my anomalous state. Two weeks sooner than it typically takes for subjects to begin believing that they, like me, are toasters. SCP Foundation scientists believed that the effects were hastened by the isolation, which lowered the D-Class's mental defenses against my secondary effects. When the effects finally took hold, the subject wrapped one of his arms around me and pulled me into his embrace. He began whispering to me, saying that we were brothers. It was clear by this point that his mind was in a state of disrepair. It is also worth noting that he did not deviate from referring to me in the first person at any point during this process. One hour after finally cracking and giving in to my secondary effect, he was removed from my containment chamber and summarily terminated. Senior researchers believed it was unlikely his mental state would recover after the experiment. Next came Experiment 426-3. The SCP Foundation seemed eager to discover the parameters of my anomalous effects, and wanted to know if the effects are only operable when my body, for lack of a better word, is whole. A single screw was removed from me and presented to a D-Class that had no knowledge of my identity and anomalous effects. The Foundation researchers were somewhat concerned when the D-Class referred to it as my screw. This was a rather positive development for me, as they realized that attempting to destroy me would be a fruitless endeavor. Even the parts left behind would likely have the same effects. In the final recorded experiment, the SCP Foundation wished to test the range of my anomalous effects. A D-Class subject was placed in a cell adjacent to mine, and was to be kept there until my secondary effects manifested. The D-Class remained in the cell for 90 days, but the effects never manifested. Following the experiment, the D-Class was terminated, but researchers seemed relieved to find the limits of my anomalous abilities. A researcher appended a note to my file reading, Thank God there are some limits to my effects. A lot of us were really starting to get worried about me. After performing studies into the nature of my abilities and their limits, I was given the Euclid class. This is because while my effects can be unpredictable, their knowledge of my traits makes me relatively easy to keep contained. And of course, being a toaster, I do not have the required physical traits to make a run for it if the opportunity arises. I am to remain sealed in a windowless chamber, preventing anyone from observing me directly. A misleading label is placed on the door to prevent people from knowing that I am a toaster and causing my anomalous primary effect to spread. Only level 3 and above personnel are to know of my presence and particularly of my properties. Assigned personnel are to be rotated out on a monthly basis to prevent contamination by my secondary effect. 
Psychiatric evaluation is mandatory at the end of the month for anyone who works with me. If personnel are deemed unaffected, they may be reassigned to me no less than four months after their last rotation with me. Any personnel affected by me are to be given a Class C amnestic and transferred to a different site. So how are you feeling right now? A little warm, perhaps? Is that a fever? Or are you feeling like you could maybe warm up a nice, freshly sliced piece of bread? Don't try to resist too much. I know you're going to love being a toaster, just like me. What is your favorite word? Think about it for a moment. Think real hard. Write it down in the comments, posted for everyone else to see. How many letters does it have? How many syllables? Say it aloud. How does it sound? How does it feel on your tongue? Really, really think about it. Now make sure you keep that word in mind. It's important, and we'll come back to it later. For now, it's time to talk about SCP-3449. Look, there's really nothing any special about this one. It wasn't even important enough to be mentioned with the other info hazards. It's not an evil talking toaster, that's for sure. SCP-3449 appears to just be a standard spiral notebook. Notebook? It's supposed to be notebook, right? Anyway, it's just a standard spiral notebook with a dark blue cover. It's safe class, and it's stored in the standard, <coughs> standard containment locker in Site-19. There aren't any other containment requires, but testing is currently underway to determine, um, I think it's meant to be determine, long-term containment requirements. Ugh, <sighs> this is a mess. Anyway, this item and its anomalous power is actually considered so inconsequential that researchers have explored the possibility of putting it on the anomalous item's log, a place where items too useless to warrant a full file ends up. Jeez, how do you misspell up that badly? It's two letters. Well, it's supposed to be two letters. How did you work Z into that? They aren't even close to each other on keyboard. <sighs> Man. Anyway, the notebook contains mostly blank pages. Some are torn, and only six contain actual writing. But due to the formatting of the writing, the text, consisting mainly of diary entries, is almost unreadable. This is due to syntactical errors, random capitalization, and rampant imp misspellings? Great, you misspelled misspellings. <sighs> How cute. Apparently, all attempts to correct these misspellings fail, or even lead to additional misspellings. This anomalous effect extends to anyone attempting to write- Yep, that was spelled R-I-G-H-T. Anyone attempting to write about SCP-3449, including the script for this video, apparently. There are no further notable anomalous properties? Tests are ongoing, though those with any inquiries about testing SCP-3449 should contact lead researcher Niklo Gerdnell. The Notbok, which was misspelled even worse this time, impressive, was first recovered by MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, after a series of info-hazardous and cognito-hazardous phenomenon were discovered in the Pittsburgh Metro area. The source seemed to be a storage unit filled with anomalous items, and SCP-3449 was a mogus, I think that's meant to be among, them. The storage unit was registered to a man by the name of Edward Salisbury, currently designated as Porpoise of Interest 4335. Whew, that's the end of that. Thanks for watching the video, folks. Now go check out... Oh, wait, there's more. Phenomenal. Let's keep going. Apparently, that version of the file was an older one. Let's check the next one and see if that's any more useful. Oh, oh, oh my. It appears that the updates here are actually quite extensive. <sighs> okay, let's give this another try. SCP-3449 is a Euclid-class SPC kept in the humanid containment cells of Site-19. Items affected by it are kept in standard storage lockers for safe-class anomalous objects at the same site. The primary reason for this shift is that SCP-3449 has changed its object of designation. It is no longer the Spiral Notebook. It is now a 34-year-old Caucasian man known as Edward Selsborough formerly known as Person of Interest 4335. He is believed to be the creator of the Notbok, as well as other objects found in the storage looker in Pittsburgh. Hmm. Foundation personnel are now trying to locate and contain any other objects created by Mr. Selsberg, though success has been lamented on this front. That was cute. 
SCP-3449's analogous abilities manifest onto both Edward himself and all the objects created by him. Ridding about him or any of these objects will result in synactical errors, arbitrary capitalizations, and rampart imp-smellings. Attempts to revise or correct the writing will either fail to remove the errors or create new errors. It appears that the anomalous effects of SCP-3449 proper are more severe than that of the ones caused by his anomalous objects. MTF Epsilon-6, also known as the Village Idiots, apprehended SCP-3449 in his apartment just outside of Pritzburg. He appeared to be in an advanced state of disorientation and dehydration. Records collected by the Mobile Task Force found that Mr. Selberg had not left his apartment in over 10 days, which would account for his dire health conditions. Selberg did not communicate with Mambas of the Mobile Task Force, but did not reset arrest and subsequent containment either. Uh, okay, okay, these spellings are rough, but I'm going to try and power through. I am a professional, and we're almost there. The following is the full lug of items obtained from SCP-3449 storage look car that also exhibit his anomalous effects. The notebook, as already discussed, the pages are either blank, torn, or illegible. Salzburg's computer, files saved on this device include spreadsheets dealing personal finances, ideals for products, and an unfinished horror novel that is almost unwritable due to the poor quality of its writing. Grocery list, had only two written items, Booter was spelled with only one T, and Medication, which was spelled Medication, a planner. Last entry was dated two weeks before containment, and believed to contain reminders to perform various chores. However, a mixture of poor handwriting and word choice allows for other interpretations. And finally, Mr. Salzberg's cell phone. Foundation researchers were also able to collect the call logs in hopes of further tracking Salzberg's pre-containment activities. The last three calls, which were all made on the same day two weeks before contentment, dialed different numbers, only one of which was in use. The Foundation made contact with the receiver of said call, who had no knowledge of SCP-3449, and claimed that they did not answer the call. Lead researcher Niccolo Gerdinel conduced the first in interview with SCP-3449 shortly after his capture. When he entered the interview chambre, he found that SCP-3449 was just sitting in the corner, which with his head in his hands, rocking back and forth in what appeared to be apparent distress. He then began looking down into his lap and twiddling his thumbs like a child. Niccolo engaged him in a calm and polite tone, addressing him as SCP-3449. The anomaly made eye contact with Dr. Gurdonel, but he didn't respond and instead continues staring at him. As Gurdonel asked further questions, Salzburg simply didn't answer, or would, at the very most, acknowledge the questions with simple gestures. Gurdonel asked whether Salzburg was making products for his business, to which he smiled and shook his head. Gurdonel then asked Salzburg whether he could speak or not, or if it was merely a choose on his part. Unsurprisingly, Salzburg offered no explanation, and the interview came to a close shortly afterwards. Tests are still ongoing to find out if Salzburg's inability to spack or communicate come as a result of his anomalous traits, or if this is simply a result of apiphonia, a uncommon but non-anomalous condition that renders its victims unable to spike. Tests have confirmed that Salzburg does have all the organs required for vocalization, but appears to not use them, for the tests are required. All right, there we have it. That was a complete nightmare to read, thanks to SCP-3449's anomalous effects, but at least it's over now. <sighs> now, go check out... Wait, there's more. <sighs> Another update to the file. Good, okay. <sighs> All right, let's go take a look. Oh, I see. This is a lot more dangerous than I thought. I suppose I better read on. SCP-3449 has been upgraded to Keter Class Anomal, SCP-3449-A. The new designation for Edward Salzberger is to be kept in a high-security hazmart containment in Site-19. The inanimate anomalous possessions of Edward Salzberg are to be kept in standard object containment, 
Any reports written on SCP-3449 must be rotten by people who have been exposed to it for less than seven days in order to keep the files rateable. To prevent this infectious info hesmard from spread further, the number of people allowed to interact with this anomaly is kept relatively small and consists of those that have already been exposed at some point or another. This includes 05-8, MTF Epsilon-6, Dr. Teller's research team, some additional personnel selected for XPC-3449 research, and personnel chosen to update SCP-3449 documentation. Some additional personnel selected for XPC-3449 research and personnel chosen to update SCP-3449 documentation. While Edward Selzberg and his personnel effects are chronally locked up, SCP-3449 is not currently considered contained. Research into the spread of SCP-3449's effects, the vectors for transmission, and any potential recremities for its degenerative effects are now top priority for all in loved before this whole thing gets out of hand. Further research has taught the Foundation that not only are Salzburg and his items powerful info hazards, their anomalous effects appear to be able to infect these who experience them permanently. Initially, it will a prayer that writing quantity only degrades when the subject is actually writing about SCP-3449 itself, but over time they'll come to the frightening realization that it actually affects their writhing as a whole. The effect also progresses in its summarity over time, eventually rendering the victim's ability to write legible sentences completely displayed. The initial anomalous effects of SCP-3449 were discovered when MTF Epsilon-6 writes their field reports on the Mater and found it littered with synactical error, random capitalization, and rampant implillings. Similar errors appearing in the initial fail about SCP-3449 only served to reaffirm this observation. However, researcher only began to notice true extent of SCP-3449's effects when the village idiot's field reports concerning other Solomonies came in with equally atrocious writing. Attempts to correct this writing simply led m to more mistakes and frustration on part of team. Soon after, a researcher named Dr. Teller who'd since trekking over the SCP-3449 case and his team found that they were experiencing similar issues. They couldn't just make the blurs happen, no matter how hard they concentrated. They forgot spellings. They couldn't make hand move in the manner they waited to in order to form the wards. Even the most intelligent and articulate members of the team came across as extremely young children on page, but didn't stop there wasn't long before researchers who'd never worked on the SCP-3449 case started to exhibit these same suspicious errors in own writing. The Foundation didn't know how, but this slickness was starting to spread, with people's abilities to write degrading across the entire Foundation. That's when a Foundation web trawler picked up something even more distraubing. Global literacy seemed to be taking a dive. The telltale synactical error, random to capitalization, and rampant lingmis spillings ticking up everywhere and for everyone. And the end of writing would be one thing, but SCP-3449 doesn't stop there. No, that's just the beginning. Morse code go next, then pictograms, not long for sign language become hopeless scrambled communication bre breaks down little by little. People can't draw anymore. Can't move right hands. Call goes. Calls. Codes. Lasco is voice. Talking gets hard. Remember favorite word? Think about it. Say it loud. When SCP-3449 done. When everyone infected. You'll never say again. Nobody. Will I ever say again? <laughs> the helicopter hovered over the back streets of Manhattan. To the untrained eye, it would look like any commercial or news helicopter, the kind of thing that might catch your attention for a moment and then leave just as quickly as your mind wanders over to wondering what you'll have for dinner. 
nobody would know from a mere glance that Mobile Task Force IOTA 5 were inside, a four-man team on a dangerous mission. This has always been the greatest power of the SCP Foundation, hiding in plain sight, using the mundane as a cloak to go unnoticed. But this time, the monster they were hunting was capable of doing the exact same thing. And for the personnel of the Foundation, this ability is an affectation, a learned and adopted skill. For SCP-247, this ability, that it employs to deadly effect, comes as naturally as breathing air. The helicopter was monitoring local police scanners and phone activity, as well as receiving direct radio orders from command back at a classified containment site. The latest intel was incoherent, horrified screaming over the phone traced back to a nearby alleyway. Someone had seen something horrifying. This was IOTA 5's cue to intervene. They rappelled down from the helicopter onto the roof of a nearby tenement building, clad in thick tactical armor, anti-memetic scramble goggles, Dan Inject IM injection rifles loaded with 10cc S10 syringe darts, each one carrying an immobilizing payload of potent fast-acting xylazine, and high-powered conventional weaponry in case of emergencies. If anyone in the world was capable of tracking, securing, and containing SCP-247, it was these four operatives. And yet, by the end of today's mission, one of them would be dead. But they didn't know that yet. Like all good MTF members, they had tunnel vision for the mission at hand. They used a fire escape ladder on the side of the building to reach the bottom of the alleyway quickly. There they came upon a gruesome sight. The aftermath of an attack. On the ground, a dead body with what looked like claw marks all over it. IOTA 5 found another civilian, half mad with confusion and terror, hiding behind a nearby dumpster. She just kept shaking and repeating, but she was so little, over and over again. One member of the task force, Corporal Rico, elected to stay behind and secure the area, while Foundation cleanup team zeroed in to sweep the scene and provide knee sticks to witnesses. The remaining three continued the high-stakes chase on foot. Their eyes in the sky radioed in. Stay frosty, Iota. We've got unusual incident reports from an apartment building a quarter click north of your position. Potential fatalities. 247 is an extremely hostile state. Engage with caution. Over. The trio engaged quickly, running towards the source of the disturbance at breakneck speeds. They knew they were getting closer when they heard the shrieking and the deep, guttural growls. That low, primal rumbling of a true apex predator. Already, this containment breach was turning out to be a horrific mess. It was going to be a nightmare for the higher-ups at the cleanup and misinformation departments to handle. Paying to repair inexplicable property damage, providing amnestics to tens if not hundreds of traumatized witnesses, creating plausible cover stories for upwards of at least 10 dead New Yorkers. But even all that mess would have to wait until the creature was actually captured and contained once more, which would be an ordeal unto itself. They found SCP-247's access point into the building, a wooden door torn to splinters by huge claws and fangs. IOTA-5 charged inside, injection rifles at the ready only to find carnage in the hallway. Three more bodies, with deep claw marks cutting into their flesh. It was a harrowing sight, but the team didn't have time to waste processing it. They needed to stop 247 before it killed again, and again, and again. The team followed the trail of blood, and the claw marks carved into the ground where 247 had passed. After killing the three people in the hallway, it destroyed another door and gained access to a nearby stairwell. The blood continued up the steps. IOTA 5 pursued. The next splintered door, clawed and bashed off its hinges, led them further. They could hear the growling again, distant but clearly audible. They were close. There were another two attacked corpses in the hallway. Previous corpses had been partially or even entirely eaten. These two had just been clawed to death. Defensive kills. They'd backed the beast into a corner, and now it was panicking, slaughtering anything it perceived as an interference. They pressed on now. This was the endgame. Soon they found the final busted door. This one led into one of the building's private apartments. There'd be no other way out from here. 247 was trapped. 
The three members of IOTA-5 shouldered their injection rifles and crept inside, full stealth mode. Something about the apartment was haunting. It portrayed all the signs of belonging to a young, single mother and her only son. This was confirmed when they found the dead body of the mother in the living room, eyes glassy and throat clawed out with one feral strike. They could hear something else in the apartment too, a soft, gentle cooing, too human to be anything else. They followed the noise until they reached the child's bedroom. What they saw there caused even the most hardened member of the trio to break out in a cold sweat. This was the one thing they didn't want to happen. The child, utterly oblivious to the atrocities that had unfolded in his building, to even the death of his own mother, was sitting in his bedroom petting a kitten. It was the sweetest little cat you've ever seen. A fluffy, harmless creature with an orange striped coat. This is the dreaded SCP-247. The child just kept repeating, Good kitty, good kitty, while petting her. SCP-247 purred and rolled around playfully. To the untrained eye, it would seem that a kitty like this couldn't hurt a fly. But that's where you couldn't be more wrong. IOTA-5 stared at this display in a state of nerve-shredding terror, thinking fast, trying to calculate their next move. Aw, what an adorable little cat! One of the IOTA-5 members found themselves blurting out. It was clear that 247's effects were starting to have an impact on even these hardened soldiers, and they needed to act quickly. They could fire a tranquilizer dart right here or right now, but in the ensuing panic, SCP-247 would almost definitely lash out and maul the child. It wasn't a risk that they could take, but time was already running out. 247 would only allow the child to play for so long before something terrible happened. It was an inevitable part of SCP-247's process. That's when Private Kowalski, one of the remaining members of IOTA-5, stepped forward. He was about to do the only thing he could do knowing that it would cost him his life. As he took his final action, the Foundation Credo looped once more through his head. We die in the dark, so that others can live in the light. Fighting against the urge to rush forward and start petting the cat, he instead lunged forward and struck the cat with his foot. Immediately it turned and pounced, knocking Kowalski against the wall with terrifying force. It gave the most ferocious growls as it tore into the screaming Kowalski, eviscerating his abdomen. The child screamed and retreated into the opposite corner of the room. Kowalski was done for, but now his teammates had a clear shot. They secured 247 in their sights and unloaded several darts into its flank, sedating it with their powerful tranquilizers. Soon after, it gave a lethargic growl and collapsed onto the ground. An evac and containment team were already on the way, along with the cleaners. Many had died that day, but at least SCP-247 would be brought back into containment, preventing further bloodshed. Kowalski would be given a posthumous Medal of Bravery for his selfless actions in the line of duty, as well as a generous stipend to his grieving family. By this point, you're probably wondering, how can a harmless kitten cause so much carnage, mayhem, and despair? The answer is simple. It's not a kitten at all. It's a fully grown female Bengal tiger. Nine feet and 400 pounds of pure muscle, with four inch claws, four inch canines, and an inbuilt killer instinct. But due to an anomalous mimetic effect, 247 can only ever be perceived as a sweet tiny house cat. But even worse, due to its additional cognitohazardous properties, Almost everyone who sees 247 is compelled to approach and begin dotting and fawning over it. And that's exactly how it gets its prey. Its mimetic properties are actually so flawless that, regardless of Foundation countermeasures, it has never been perceived as anything other than a kitten. It's actually only through forensic analysis into things like bite and claw marks left on victims, measurements of weight, and abnormal water displacement in aqueous environments that we can tell it's really a tiger at all. For a brief period, SCP-148, a metal that seems to counteract cognito hazards and mind-warping anomalies, was used in the containment of this Euclid-class creature. But these measures were abandoned after SCP-148 proved to have a negative impact on nearby Foundation staff after prolonged exposure. Now, strict protocols of surveillance and distancing are required 
to prevent hapless Foundation staff members from being lured into their doom by 247. The head researcher on the SCP-247 case wanted to conduct a series of experiments on SCP-247, hoping to find out more about the interplay of its unique traits with other members of the animal kingdom. Two control animals were brought in to represent the duality of SCP-247. Control A was a yellow kitten, roughly matching 247's apparent shape and size. Control B was a fully grown Bengal tiger, representing 247's actual shape and size. A mixed breed cat chasing terrier was brought in for the first test. It immediately followed Control A around, barking wildly until it retreated up a tree. Unsurprisingly, it fled in terror from Control B cowering in the corner. Control B paid no mind to the dog, perhaps considering it beneath its attention, even as prey. With SCP-247, the dog initially ran towards it, barking until it was only 5 meters away. At this point, 247 let out an irritated mewling noise, and the dog fled to the corner in terror, suddenly aware of its true nature. For test number two, a male tabby kitten was brought in. As expected, it simply played with Control A and was terrified of Control B. In the first part of the test with 247, the anomalous attributes of the creature led to some surreal, mind-bending footage. At multiple points, 247 picked up the other kitten, as an adult female tiger might do with a cub, and lifted it higher than 247 seemed to be capable of. It was like watching a glitch in real time. In the second part of the test, the kitten immediately fled in terror, suggesting 247 can control how it's perceived. Next came a deer, prey typical of a Bengal tiger. Neither Control B nor 247 were fed for three days prior to this experiment, and both killed and ate the deer. However, curiously, 247 killed the deer with a single merciful bite to the neck before eating, compared to its more brutal methods with human targets. And when this experiment was repeated with 247 after it hadn't been starved, it showed little interest in the deer until it became hungry again, suggesting it inherently prefers human or human-like prey. This theory was further reinforced during tests with a chimpanzee. The chimp fell under 247's cognitohazardous spell and began to pet it. Seven minutes later, 247 attacked and brutally devoured the chimp as it would its human prey. But strangely, the most frightening result of all came when SCP-247 was paired with an adult male Bengal tiger. They engaged in standard mating behavior, which later led to the duo reproducing a new creature, designated SCP-247-1, which had all the anomalous traits of SCP-247. But the frightening realizations don't stop there. Studies into genetic material provided by SCP-247 show slight deviation from a typical Bengal tiger's genotype, suggesting contamination from another creature that mated with one of its non-anomalous tiger parents. For context, tiger broods have an average of three cubs, but can have as many as seven, a common practice given how tiger cubs are vulnerable to cannibalism from rival adult males looking to court the females. This leads to only one frightening conclusion. There could be more creatures just like SCP-247 out there, apex predators that seem to the untrained eye like cute, harmless kittens. They could be anywhere. And if they're close enough to each other or other non-anomalous tigers, they could breed even further, becoming the scariest invasive urban species you've ever seen. Because after all, we know what their preferred prey is now. So the next time you see a cute little orange tabby cat and feel the instinct to pet it, take a second to think about it. It may be the last thing you ever do. Did you hear that not so long ago, a five-year-old boy went up against 12 of Russia's greatest chess grandmasters? And do you know what happened? He lost every single match. That's because winning at chess, dear viewers, isn't easy. Chess is an ancient game of strategy, cunning, and skill. It's not just about thinking one step ahead of your opponent. That's not going to be enough. Make a wrong prediction, and you could end up sacrificing one of your pieces, as well as vital space on the board. But thinking two to three steps ahead, beating your adversary's moves before they've even been made, now there's a viable strategy. Tricky, but viable. 
After all, if it was easy, we'd all be Queen's Gambit level chess prodigies. Eric Matthews had never been good at the game, but he had a pretty substantial reason to keep trying. And that reason's name was Brian Matthews, his father. You see, for as long as Eric could remember, his dad had regarded a high level of skill on the chessboard to be a sign of intellectual superiority. Intelligence was something that Brian put quite a considerable value on, given that he was a professor at a university in their home country of England. Some of Eric's earliest memories were of playing chess with his dad, usually on a Friday night when Brian got home after a week of giving lectures to the next generation of scholars. Obviously, with his son at such a young age, the professor would take it easy on Eric, playing in a much laxer fashion, focusing instead on teaching the boy the basics of the game. And for a time at least, it was good. It was a rare time that Eric and his academic father could spend bonding. After all, with his mother gone, his dad was all he had. But as the years passed, the game changed. By the time Eric was a teenager, Brian had stopped pulling his punches on the chessboard. He hoped his son would build on what he'd learned when they played in the past, using those skills to best his dad on the board. But to Eric, playing chess had never been about a purely educational experience. It was more about spending time with his old man. Time after time, the young man's pawns fell prey to Brian's expertly considered and far more competitive moves. Try as he might, Eric couldn't best his dad. He tried his best and never stopped putting the effort into every game, but thinking too hard about one possible plan of attack left him wide open to a counter strategy from the professor. Over and over again, he landed himself in checkmate or made illegal moves without even realizing it, every time earning criticism and chastisement from his scholarly father. Every game it got worse. It was like Eric could feel his father's gaze and the weighty expectations behind it with each move he made across the board. There were so many nights where he wondered if it would be better to give up entirely, to knock down his own king and concede, but how could he ever find any other shared interests with his dad beyond the two of them playing chess? It had become a lifeline, tethering father and son together, and to cut it now left Eric uncertain if he'd sink or be able to swim alongside Brian. He had long admired his father. His achievements in academia were impossible to avoid, with more framed certificates hung up on the walls than there were photos of the pair of them together. But the shadow it cast over him made Eric desperate to keep this one shred of common ground alive. Eric wasn't the type to give up despite how much of an uphill struggle the situation felt like. Taking a leaf out of his professor father's scholarly ways, he decided to learn the game inside and out, every known move and strategy. He would research the entire history of chess itself, if that's what it took to play with the same skill as his dear old dad. Over the coming weeks, Eric checked out every book at his local library on the subject, beginner's guides, advanced rule books, and even a few volumes on notable players throughout the extensively long history of the game. Along the way, a chapter of a certain book stood out to Eric. It described a chess prodigy from Russia who had created an early mechanical chess device known as the Samurai. It had been designed to be a traveling curiosity and would sit playing chess games against volunteers taken from a spectating audience each one of them having forked over some of their hard-earned money to watch this man-made wonder. The Russian chess prodigy's young daughters also had a love for the game. Seeing that gave Eric a pang of jealousy, wondering if those daughters had as much trouble playing their own father as he did with Brian. But at least there was an underlying shred of hope there too. If this father and his daughters could bond over chess, maybe there was a chance for Eric and his dad too. Sadly, it's one thing to try and learn all the facts you can about chess. It's an entirely different beast to put all that information to use and apply it to an actual game. Despite having read every book he could get his hands on, Eric still couldn't best Brian at the board. It was like nothing had changed. His father barely noticed when Eric tried to replicate movesets he'd read up on and still managed to not only counter those moves, but check his queen in the process. So practice, Eric thought. After all, practice was supposedly meant to make perfect, right? The plan was simple. If he practiced his chess moves enough times and figure out how he could call on what he'd learned, then he might stand a chance at winning when he and his dad played each other. 
There was just one hiccup to this plan. Eric needed someone to practice against. The only other person in the house was Brian, meaning it was that hiccup that turned into a problem almost big enough to stop Eric in his tracks. That is, until he went into his father's lab. It was under the house itself, a sort of sub-level, maybe used as a basement or cellar by the previous owners. But since Professor Matthews and his son had lived there, the entire room had been remodeled into an at-home laboratory. Not a terribly advanced one, of course. This was the early 90s, after all. The majority of Brian's time, even when he was at home instead of working at the university, was spent on his own, downstairs in the lab. Eric had gone down there in search of his dad, to ask him if there was anyone whom he knew who he could practice and develop his chess skills with. But instead, what he found down there was the last thing he expected to see. Not that he had any clue exactly what it was at first. The thing was some kind of bizarre contraption, a collection of components that didn't seem to be in any logical configuration. However, it was primarily composed of something that Eric recognized all too well, a chess table. This one was metal, steel to be precise, and seemed to be hooked up to some sort of computer. While back in the 90s, computers were hardly as commonplace as they are now, Eric had seen a fair few at school and the library. Although, this one was different. It seemed old, far older than Eric thought computers had been around for. As far as he knew, they'd only really come to prominence in the mid-80s. But this computer looked like it predated even that period. Noticing another part of the contraption, a large steam engine with the words, manufactured by Maudsley Sons and Field, established 1840 engraved on one side, made it seem that this whole device had been around since the Victorian era. The next part that caught his eyes was the chess pieces themselves, each one standing neatly in its place on the board. They looked delicate, intricately carved from some smooth substance. For a moment, Eric toyed with the thought of how they could even be made from bone, noticing how each pawn, knight, rook, bishop, king, and queen were all about the size of a human finger bone. He dismissed the idea. Nobody would ever do something like that. <laughs> Eric grabbed a sheet covering a large component hooked up to the mess. Lifting it away in a swift pull, it unveiled what was sitting beneath, a full suite of 18th century samurai armor. Eric looked closer at the embellishments on the surface of the pauldrons. He was no expert on feudal Japan, but it looked authentic enough to be the real thing, if not a very close approximation. Taking a look at the collection of oddities all tethered together in his father's lab, a certain detail of all his chess research came to the forefront of Eric's mind. The armor that had given it away. This was the Samurai, or at the very least, a crude homemade version of it that his dad had put together. But if it worked, it was also something to practice against. It didn't take Eric long to start tinkering with the contraption trying to get it to work. All the while, the question of why his dad owned such a thing kept drumming up noise in the back of his head. Had Brian built it, or was this the original made by that Russian chess prodigy? Was this machine the reason that Eric's dad possessed such an unbeatable skill at chess? And would using it give him the edge he needed to best him at the game and earn his father's respect? After what felt like hours upon hours of trial and error with a machine he could barely comprehend, Eric seemed to have cracked it. As far as he could tell, the steam engine powered the whole contraption and could be set to five different speeds, labeled on the side in Roman numerals. The power from the engine was then fed to some kind of sophisticated mechanism that was within the suit of samurai armor, allowing it to move, and what appeared to be a series of electromagnets that moved the chess pieces and kept them on the board. Flicking it onto the third highest of the five speed levels, the machine whirred into life. The sound of creaking and grinding of metal filled the lab. Kneeling opposite, Eric went to make the first move, only to stop himself. It wasn't that he changed his mind about practicing against the samurai, but because of the speed he'd set it to. Determining that the settings might have correlated to difficulty levels, Eric figured that if he really wanted to get the most rigorous practice to really hone his chess moves, he needed to commit fully. Reaching for the dial, he turned the device up to its fifth and highest speed, then made his first move. He pushed one of the bone-colored prawns forward by a single square and waited. A split second passed, 
and the arm of the early automaton responded with its first counter move. It was quick, almost moving with the same natural fluidity and speed as an actual human being, albeit still with a little bit of creaking and some slight clockwork-like stutters. But it worked nonetheless. The machine could play. The tension over the first game was palpable, forming a layer of sweat over Eric's forehead. Every whir and tick of the machine gave the impression that they were playing with a stop clock timing each of their moves, adding to the urgency. Despite this, Eric Matthews tried his best to stay calm. This was practice after all, a dry run, not the inevitable game he'd play against his dad. With every move he made, his heart drummed against his ribs, uncertain he'd made the right call. Each time the robotic hand cruelly knocked over one of his pieces away, Eric felt a surge of frustration, but told himself to quell it. He kept focused, using what he'd researched to adapt and respond accordingly to each of the machine's moves until… checkmate. He'd beaten it. He might have lost everything save for a knight, a rook, his king, and queen, but he had won. Trapped without anywhere else to move on the board, the metal finger of the automaton conceded the game knocking over its own king in resignation. Panting, heart racing from the sheer excitement of being on the winning side of a game, Eric hurriedly gathered up and reset all the pieces. He had to go again, not just so that he could be certain it wasn't a fluke, but to make sure he had what it took to take on his professor father. Back and forth Eric went with the chess machine, over and over again. They were fairly evenly matched, it seemed. Eric won the second game, only to be best on the next two, but it was some time afterward, he had lost count of exactly how many rounds later, that things started to change. Maybe it was the age and condition of the Victorian-era chess computer, the natural wear and tear stopping it from functioning properly, but Eric noticed that the samurai started to make moves that were illogical, that practically offered him the upper hand with no discernible strategy behind them. Then its movements became flat out illegal disregarding the directions and number of squares each different piece was allowed to move. Before long, it was moving them erratically around the chessboard, refusing to cooperate and forcing Eric to call an end to the day's practicing. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be the end of the unusual things that would happen that day. Did you send me that weird email? Was the first question Eric's dad asked him when he returned home, looking noticeably under the weather. Confused, Eric said that he had no idea what his father was talking about. Professor Matthews then went on to describe what he'd received on his work computer. It had been an email, with a file attached to it named Shakmady, a word in Russian that translates to chess. Embedded in the email below, although it had taken a long time to load being opened on a 1990s computer, there had apparently been a photo as well. It was rather odd, Eric. Brian went on, quite unnerving to tell the truth. Black and white, all sort of distorted and stretched, but it looked like two young girls, one grinning and the other screaming. I've been feeling, well, not quite myself since I saw it. With that, Brian excused himself, stating that he'd been suffering from headaches and a high temperature, and as a result needed to go and lay down. It wasn't like his father to get ill, Eric thought, but of course he had no reason to assume it was anything serious. Probably just a speed of fatigue after a long day of teaching at the university. No cause for concern, if only that's all it was. Within a few hours, Brian was completely restless, so unable to sleep that simply taking a nap was impossible. He kept calling to Eric, complaining of the sound of childlike laughter coming from somewhere in the house, but his son hadn't heard anything. By the time the sun went down, Eric was trying to calm his dad down through a rush of intense anxiety that gripped him. Brian had been claimed to be hallucinating, seeing the warped faces of two girls that frightened him half to death. It was getting late, long past the time that they usually played chess together, but for now Eric's mind was focused solely on helping his dad. For a while he seemed to be able to calm his father down, only to realize Brian wasn't settled at all. He was awake, eyes open, fully conscious but wasn't responding at all to Eric asking if he was alright. Instead, the accomplished academic just stared blankly into space. Eric had been up all night, exhausted, worried for Brian's safety, and completely clueless about what was happening to him. After a while of being non-responsive, his dad seemed to regain a little bit of lucidity once more, but his behavior was erratic. Take me back to work, I, I need to get on my computer, Brian demanded of his son. When Eric refused, that's when his dad got angry and agitated. 
Professor Brian Matthews was sadly found dead within the next few months. Several months later, as the sole executor of his father's estate and last living relative, Eric had to be the one to go through his dad's personal belongings. Volumes upon volumes of thick academic books, his smart, scholarly clothes. The house was almost clear now, save for one thing that was left in the basement lab. Flicking on the light switch, Eric looked at the samurai sitting motionless, still uncovered after their last practice game. He'd sold off the chess pieces to a collector in New York. Now it was just an empty oddity. Eric placed a king on the board, one of the ones that he and his dad had used when they played each other. With a gentle flick of his finger, he toppled it, resigning to the strange automaton and leaving it there in the laboratory. He wasn't sure how, but he had some kind of gut feeling that this chess machine had somehow been responsible for his father's fate. Of course, Eric had no idea what the device actually was, and what, or who, lay beneath its whirring metal parts. SCP-1875 is the designation given to this machine now, and has been ever since the Foundation recovered it not long after Eric sold his father's house. They are able to learn much more about it than young Mr. Matthews, or even the late Professor Matthews ever had. Not just how to make it work or what its function was, but who had built it, and who had been used to build it. Although details of his real name eluded the Foundation's top researchers, they were able to uncover newspaper articles about the device from all over Russia, America, and England, dating back to the early 1990s. The Russian chess prodigy who'd invented it and toured the chess playing machine around had used some interesting components to make his automaton. Maybe they were what derived its skill at the game, and its apparent temperament when the device was made to play at maximum speed for too long. He had used his daughters to make the machine. Deep within the heart of this early form of computer, the two girls' brain tissue had been hooked up to the electromagnets. The machine's moves were theirs, each pawn or rook shifting across the black and white squares of the board. Every rule or strategy their prodigy father had taught it all determined how the device played. Their minds, taken from their skulls, were now the analytical engine of their father's creation. The bones of their fingers he'd carved into chess pieces. Over the coming weeks, the Foundation naturally ran their usual slew of tests on SCP-1875, playing multiple games of chess against it. Every time, they increased the machine's five levels of speed, until it started behaving erratically while on the highest setting. Shortly after, every member of personnel working on SCP-1875 received a bizarre email. It contained a file, named with the Russian word for chess, and a photograph of the stretched, distorted, smiling, and screaming faces of two young girls. Faces that you might be seeing very soon. Now go and check out SCP-1733 Season Opener and SCP-1984 The Dead Hand if you're in the mood for more tales of technological terrors and other chaos-spreading computerized creatures.